Thanks, eh? Folks, I'd like to call this meeting to order, seeing that it's at uh, 6.04, and I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the uh, Town of Citrus Board of Selectmen's meeting. Um, is there anybody in here who is recording this other than our, um, our John, our John Roser, our um, videographer? Yes, it's Jessica Bartlett for the Boston Globe. Anyone else? Fair enough. Um, I'd like to um, move um, an acceptance or have an acceptance of our agenda. So moved. Moved second by Mr. Murray, seconded by Mr. Vignani. Uh, discussion, seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 It's very good. Moving on to the second agenda, which happens to also be a walk-in period. Are there any walk-ins? Seeing none, move on to the third agenda item, which is to meet applicants. And in particular, I believe we are looking for is Andrea Steele here. Steele, could you please come up to the, po uh, the podium? Come up to the table here. I understand that you filed an application to, uh, for the uh, Citrus uh, Beautification Commission. Um, the only question I had from your application is, is your house one of the original Lawson uh, estate yes, houses? Yes, it is, the um, dog kennels. Oh, interesting. So uh, I think it was bulldogs we used to have. But anyway, that's what I was curious about. Yeah, you missed the uh, tour. I, I did. I have Historical I, tour. <laughs> I always look at the one of the buildings in Norwell Center. I think there's a building there that mm -hmm. belonged, I thought, to the kennels. But anyway, um, I have no questions. I'm very happy to see that you're interested in doing, um, joining the Beautification uh, Committee. It's a, it's a great committee, a lot of hard work by a lot of people, and uh, um, certainly makes our town look a lot better. So. I agree. Any well, other questions from the board? I they could use all the help. They do a great job. Thank you for volunteering. Okay. Thank you yeah. very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you for it. volunteering. Um, that concludes agenda item number three. <coughs> like to move to agenda item number four. It's a discussion vote, transfer of class three license. And on behalf of the applicant is Christopher Litchfield here. Yes. Mr. Litchfield, could you please come on up? And you're looking for a transfer of a class three license. Um, I guess I assume it's it's part of the repair shop is what yes. you're looking for, right? Okay. And um, transfer from. My father to me. That's what I thought. And my, my yeah, condolences. My Thank condolences, you. Mr. Litchfield. Um, I have no f no questions. Anyone else from the board? No. Just maybe a comment. I've known, you know, the Litchfield family for quite a long time, and uh, the, uh, like I said, like I said, his dad has held this license for many, many years. So. Like a motion, Mr. Chair, please. Move the board's selectman vote to transfer the class three license held by Ray's Repair Shop to Christopher Litchfield doing business as Ray's Repair Shop 364 Clap Road Second. 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 Second by Mr. Uh, Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number five, a discussion vote one day malt, uh, wine and malt beverage license for the Appalachia services to be held 
at St. Mary's is Catherine Brooks here. Could you please come on up to the uh, table, please? You're looking for a one-day uh, wine, beer and wine um, all beverage license, so to speak, yeah. for March 19th, which is a Saturday. It's going to be held at St. Mary's. It's for the benefit of the Appalachian uh, Service Project. You're having a grand old Opry, it sounds like, music, and um, I'm giving you PR right now. Everyone's From 6 30 to 11 o'clock p.m., and it is for fundraising for <coughs> the high schoolers, I think, if I'm not mistaken, to be able to go down, which has been going on for 20 plus years, I think. What is that? Not sure how long. But anyway, did I miss anything? Questions from the board? What, is that a Friday or Saturday? Saturday night. Saturday night? The day before St. Patty's. The, pa the parade. So. That was my, uh, <laughs> my thought. Oh. Well, good. Um, is there a motion, please? Move the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a one-day malt, uh, wine and malt beverages license for uh, the Appalachian Service Project fundraiser to be held at St. Mary's Parish Center, 110th Street on Saturday. March 19th from 6.30 p.m. to 11 p.m. Second. Seconded by Mr. Harris. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kim, where should she? I think. All right, moving on to discussion. Uh, item number six. It's a discussion of the um, fiscal year 2012 budgets. Since we were talking about beautification, we're going to start with the beautification committee. Is there somebody here for the beautification committee? Oh. 650, right? Yep. Well, I'll tell you oh, what. We could do that, John. We could, we? I think we probably could. Let's see. Is that 650? Beautification. 630. Hang on. 650. Why don't we go to historical and we'll come back to beautification? How about that? How about 691? Historical. Historical. <coughs> Who's here Trish. for historical? Trish would Trish are you doing the beautification? No and stood up. I see oh, Dave yeah. Ball back there. Dave. Are, are you doing? Are, are, are you here for the historical, the budget? If you could just if you could just identify yourselves just for the record. Dave's going to do this one. All right. <laughs> David Ball, uh, Central Historical Society. All right. And Betty Meisner, Central Historical Society. Good evening, Betty. Good evening, Dave. All right. Um, Dave, the process that we've been doing is just asking people to read their mission statement. Um, do you have that there, or do you want me to read it for you? Right here somewhere. I'll tell you, I'll read it for you. How about okay, that? Good. It's the, a the municipality is judged in good part by how well its historical properties are maintained. Situate has seven town-owned historical structures. The Cudworth House, 1797. Situate Lighthouse, 1811. Mann Farmhouse, 1825. Massachusetts Humane Boathouse, 1896. Uh, the Irish Moss, uh, Moss Shed, 1900. Lawson Tower, 1902. And the Lawson Gates from 1902. Our mission is to maintain these important structures for future generations and to provide educational opportunities at these properties so the public, public has a good understanding of the role these buildings played in the development and history of our town. And um, do you have some goals that you, I, I, try, I just briefly try to say, what are some of the goals that you had this year that you, that you met, some of the goals that you're looking for this coming year, and then we'll hit the budget. That you. Can you address any of those, Dave, for for the goals? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're we're always focused on education. We we uh, are always interested in having, especially situate school students, visit the sites. And this year we had uh, probably more students than ever before uh, visiting several of the sites. Many of the schools will spend a couple of days um, visiting multiple sites. We also um, to accommodate school students from across the South Shore. Um, we've had them this year from Weymouth and Cohasset. And, um, all well, if I remember correctly. So 
that's one of our main goals is to make sure that we are addressing the educational needs of the town uh, it's about this time of the year when we start hearing from the school systems we've heard from one already this week uh, <laughs> our busy time of the year for that is spring is, uh, later in the spring time. Uh, but we will accommodate anyone that really wants to take a look at these sites anytime during the year um, like all boards and committees and commissions in town I know we're we're all faced with some tough economic times. Our concern, of course, is maintaining these buildings um, in a proper fashion. Our budget request this year really was for um, just the electrical costs, the natural gas, and other utility services. There really isn't that much in there for maintaining the buildings. Probably get through one more year of not doing a lot of maintenance but we just want to forewarn the board that we're going to be taking a, a, a close look at the maintenance issues coming up in the near future, and the, some of these things will have to be addressed. In your budget right now, it looks like it's you're requesting 6700 6700 6, request, which is uh, just a, a quick breakdown. That was for electricity, natural gas, water, sewer, and alarm systems. Questions from the board? Uh, just a quick one, Dave. <coughs> um, you say in your write-up, <coughs> excuse me, that sixty-two thousand came from the historical trust account. That was a couple of years ago. Oh, that was two thousand and ten. So yeah. okay. And typically, most people probably know that when there's a repair that needs to be done, you try and go to CPC if it can be historically significant and, and get the funding from there. Um, and I know that there's a couple things on the on the. Agenda not tonight. much left. Just kidding. Uh, there, there's <laughs> not the the the, the sixty two thousand that you mentioned that came out of the uh, MBTA train yeah. account. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few thousand left in that account. We're trying to really uh, be very careful about spending any of that. We did have to spend some a year ago, if you remember correctly. We came in before the board for a rock removal at the White House last March. There's there's a little bit left in that account, but we're really very judicious about using that. Right. Thanks. Rick? Uh, yeah, I just, I've said this each for the last couple of years, um, and I, I don't think I'm gonna need to say it much longer as, as this change has come about, but just so everybody knows, although these are representatives from the Historical Society, this is not money that the town is giving to the Historical Society. Um, several years ago, we changed actually how it was cataloged or how it was described in the budget because it used to say on the town meeting floor, it used to say historical, and people were getting confused thinking that the town was, was giving mm. money to the society. Yeah. Um, and so with Rick Agnew, this board worked, worked to change it so it you know, appropriately says historical buildings. These are town-owned historical buildings that in terms of the relationship we have with the society, they oversee them and maintain them for the town as a service to the town, as a benefit to the town. So um, this 6700 is for the maintenance of town-owned historical properties. And uh, I just think it's very clear that people understand exactly what's, what's going on here because it's a very good synergistic relationship we have with the society um, in this way. Thank you. And I make one comment. Uh, when I looked at the preliminary budget, it's had historical commission on it, and we're the society. There's a big difference. <laughs> no, that's right, and this is for the buildings. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Could I could I just throw out one thing so sure. everyone is well aware of it? This year is the 200th anniversary of the construction of Sitio Lighthouse, uh, so we're going to be celebrating the 200th anniversary of that light, and uh, we're going to be planning a couple of events. One of the big ones will be at the Barker Tavern next September, uh, where there'll be a, a really interesting program on in the whole history of the lighthouse. Um, and the other thing I'd like to just say again, and I've said it before, Situate Lighthouse was constructed in 1811. There are a couple of lighthouses, including Boston Light, that are older than Situate Light, but when you take the whole facility, well, the Keepers Cottage and the, and the Light Tower, <coughs> Situate is the oldest complete lighthouse in the country. So it's really a, a cool fact, I think. But I think the kids in this town are well aware of that because we keep telling them. But maybe they <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Keep telling Thank us, you, too, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>
We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which ha or not agenda item, the next budget, which is the uh, council on, council on aging. Lawrence, what number is that? That's five forty one. Thank you, Dave. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Good evening. If you could, could you just read your mission statement sure, for us? Okay. Actually, you know what? And I apologize, uh, Mr. De Lorenzo and the members of the um, um, uh, advisory committee. If there are any questions too, I'll defer to you also. So, uh, because it's kind of a joint meeting between both our boards, so I apologize. I failed to do that, but I'll make sure that we do it. I don't think you had any questions on the $6,700, so we'll make sure we do that going forward. Uh, before I start, I'd like to um, introduce our chairman of our board, Pam Davis. Pam, good evening. Thank you. The mission statement is as follows. The purpose of the Situate Council on Aging is to identify needs and implement programs that will enhance the quality of life and independence of the seniors of Situate and to educate the community to the needs of the seniors. Thank you. Um, you know, looking at your goals and your challenges, obviously there's a more recent challenge that you've undergone, which mm. happens to be a roof situation. Yes, so yeah. clearly it gets us back to the facilities and the structure and yeah. the, the inadequacies was, thereof. Yeah, it was pretty scary, um, thank goodness. It happened before the seniors were in there. So. Um, so I, I presume that's probably your highest priority that you're it talking is, about. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, safety is our highest priority. Are there any things based on your goals and objectives from last year you'd like to highlight, uh, Florence? Well, um, one of the things that um, our goals and objectives are, are, are done because I had been looking at, of course, the state of the budget, knew that we were going to have problems. And, uh, we are very fortunate. We have 350 council on aging <laughs> in the state of Massachusetts. And we have a lobbying group, an uh, educational group. We all belong to it. It's called the Massachusetts Council on Aging. We're also affiliated with the National Council on Aging. And because of that, I get a lot of alerts and emails. We have a lot of meetings in terms of budgets. I was just on the <coughs> Friday to a, a, at a legisl South Shore legislators meeting. So I was really aware, and you know, because of that, what was going down. So I did a couple of things um, to, uh, to see if we could uh, help shore up uh, and make <coughs> sure our programs continued, because they're crucial. Uh, one of them w was uh, I put uh, in our newsletter, as I'm sure you've all seen, there is a page that asks for donations. And I started that probably about a year ago. And um, we have a steady group of donations every week. It's uh, to the senior center. We are not a 5013C, but that isn't a problem. I checked with the attorney general. We, um, we, we just make it clear that it's, tax, it's not tax deductible. And that's all the attorney general said we had to. So that is you know, something that we can put into programming or we can have there. In case of um, in case of problems that we may have to uh, turn the senior away for services, the other thing that we have done is we've made a goal to have four fundraisers this year. Uh, one of them will not be completed this year because we are doing a, a cookbook, and we have a senior art program at uh, at the Situate Senior Center. Very very some of the, the local artists who are very well known are participants in that. And they are going to illustrate that cookbook. And so it's going to be an illustration and, uh, and the recipes, a combination of both. So I, I'm very, very aware that we need something to protect our staff and our services. So I'm trying to you know, go outside of that, looking for ways to raise money. Um, we, our grant this year, we, we will certainly go after that. We also, I applied for a 14 passenger van. And uh, knowing the state of the budget, I talked to Tricia and she was very nice to agree that if we came up out of our programs with half what, of what the town needs to come up with, 
then um, we would be able to, uh, if the town would match us, and Tricia said that she thought they would. So we're waiting to hear. That van will allow us two things. We have an underserved population in the town of Situate, and that is because we don't have a, a lot of money, even though we spend a lot, uh, we gave almost 6,000 rides last year to seniors, and we have multiple uses for our vans. One of the, the problem is we have a handicap um, population who are under 60 and we try to to you know to we have to keep the seniors <coughs> first, but we try to accommodate them whenever we can and sometimes it's very very difficult we can't and so the 14 passenger van would allow us to um, increase the rides that we give to that population to maybe the store to do shopping to a medical appointment because you know they really, they need to be dis, uh, served. So the Commission on Disability, uh, Je Jeff Duggan and myself and their, their committee and our board are working together. The other thing that uh, we did try to get the ride into Situate because, um, and they refused us. So um, we are going on another, um, we're looking at another avenue. But um, we are trying very hard to fill that need because it's an unmet need that should be met. Um, and uh, we do have a brand new software system that's awesome. It was, um, we got, uh, most of it was paid for, uh, actually all of it was paid for by a grant. The grant from the company that uh, paid three quarters and our grant from the uh, state paid $2,500. This software is awesome. All the teachers, all the seniors come in and they have a fob and they, you know, and then they touch what program they're using. Uh, we can look at how programs are running. We can get, get numbers, we can get demographics. We can tell you how, you know, we're trying to improve service delivery. So we're, we can tell you how long it takes to do something, what the results are, and it's terrific. It's the best thing we ever had. So, and all of our equipment, I'm proud to say, every bit of the equipment in the senior center has been paid for by grants. Good. So, Good. you know, so we try to. Uh, You're making do. There's no doubt about it. In a very tough time, and not only that, but given I, we can certainly, the facilities are something that this town is going to have to address going forward. Oh yeah. But um, but I have to say thank you, and, and thank you very much for all the efforts, Pam, committee members put together, and and for all the. You know, to try to maintain some of these programs and there's certainly many programs that we should have that we don't but a lot of that's due to the function of the facilities but um but turning to your budget good. i know yeah. um i see that um what you um, requested is basically about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and the variation here is about five thousand between mm -hmm. you and the town administrator mm -hmm. so there's really not much of a no. change here no. um, mm -hmm. are there questions from the board from the board of selectmen on on so the budget. Just a question. Sort right. of a uh, one of you, Florence. Did I understand you said that you have 60,000 rides you give a year? Six. Six. No, six. Okay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we could never do that. <laughs> we couldn't afford it. Oh, we need you know, more than one actually, van. Actually, yeah. we are. It's like, <laughs> I wonder why you need a new van. <laughs> I was going to say, Let's I don't think a 14 passenger van is going to cut it. The situation is second in the number of rides that are given in the South Shore. And that includes the, the only town that's ahead of us is Weymouth. Oh. It's oh. a tribute. Okay. That's, that's right. Okay. And then the, que more. the question I had for Tricia, because you were talking so much about yeah. the new software and so things like that, the new IT individual will be tasked with helping oversee Everyone. this? Good. After that's I good. get Great. my hands up. Thank you. And is that one of the reductions here? No, the, the major reduction is because um, Florence has, the Council on Aging has a fairly new van. Her expenditures compared with prior years for vehicle maintenance and repair is significantly mm -hmm. lower. So okay. I think there's something like 30,000 that was reduced, and that's mm -hmm. the bulk of her budget reduction. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Or turn over to the advisory. Uh, would anybody have any questions? Uh, just, just one question, Florence, on the paratransit. I think in the past we used to handle that as a revolving fund. And I don't know that we ever, we used to allocate 25 grand or so, and I don't know that we ever went back 
and reconciled what we actually spent against that fund. Is, is this number, given what you've spent to date, is this 24000 The 24000 is the money that, I believe it's mitigation money, was it, or was it just town voted money? It was a special article yeah. that was separate yeah. from the budget, and yeah. it shouldn't have been ever right. in my mind. Yeah. So well, we, you, you we allocated it last year into yeah. her budget. Yeah. Right. So my question is more, with half the year gone and $4,000 being spent, are we going to spend the full twenty-four thousand, and you need twenty-four thousand? Well, when you year? look at that, I don't know, and I'm I'm the first to tell Trisha if we don't need it. The um, the link is what what is situate rod, right. and the the um, the difference is that I mean we have people sometimes uh, we have people going to Boston, and we have a vendor who is um, South Shore Community Action Council that uh, that drive that picks them up and drives. We have people who are on the van two and three days a week if they have di dialysis or chemotherapy. Mm. We have some people with dialysis have been taking that ride for a couple of years and some have died. Um, we also are fortunate to have a large group of volunteer drivers. So, you know, for some of our, our seniors that are getting older and it's more difficult for them to ac access the van, you know, uh, we try to make special accommodations, either get an escort, and we do have some great people who will go on the van with them, go to their medical appointments and, and come back, or somebody who, who is able to, uh, to drive them. It's, it's a very hairy thing, and we have to be very careful about that because we don't want to put our volunteers in any kind of harm's way. So you have to really assess the liability, and we do assess everybody who is on our van. So we know, you know, what the status is, how safe they are, uh, what the liability holds for a situate, and that's one of the big things we're always conscious about liability. Any, did, does that answer your question, Bob? Or, okay. Anybody else from advisory? Any discussion for any questions from the floor? All right. Um, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I welcome. appreciate it. Thanks, Floyd. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Moving back to the beautification, if I could, at 650. 650. Donna, good evening. As you're setting down, the mission statement is to enhance the beauty of Situate through planning and maintaining select, uh, selected public spaces using community resources. And um, pretty much, you've requested $15,000. Level and, funded. and it's level funded and that's exactly what's been recommended yes and we're very pleased <laughs> um, I have no questions are there questions at all from the board keep no. up the good work Just go questions from advisory at all anybody well Donna thank you very much short and sweet <laughs> Thanks for well coming. said we Donna. said the better they say sometimes <laughs> they do great work try not to hit them when they're on the roads uh, Cleaning up the medians. If we had less uh, less of a, an agenda that we do, I'd be inclined to go through a little bit more. So I appreciate it very much. Um, moving on to the uh, Commission on Disabilities, five four nine. Five forty nine. Welcome me? at Bingo. Oh, no, that's me. Keep the. Uh, um, it's level funded, and I think Florence just alluded to what those funds can be spent to um, subsidize and assist for HP transport and uh, other Keep help for disabled folks. And, and the budget item for a Commission on Disabilities, everybody hold on to your seats for $5,075. So that's what we're talking about here. And don't we have to? Isn't it mandatory that we? Yes, I'm actually learning. I suggested to Jeff that that might need it to be cut a little because it's been held harmless like any other budgets. And I was, I'm afraid of them now. So, um, Jeff Dugan, yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> so, Very articulate man. For FY12, we're, we're good. Yes, I, it's my understanding there needs to be some appropriation. The amount is not, I'm not <coughs> yet convinced that it needs to be that particular. Okay. All right, any questions at all from advisory on, on that? Okay. So let's move on to the library. It's 610, which is the next section. Good evening, ladies. Good evening. Just identify yourselves for the record. Um, 
I'm Kathy Meeker, the director of the library. And I'm Mary Ellen Gaziano. I'm the chairperson of the library board of trustees. Good evening and welcome. Um, could you just read the mission statement? Certainly. Yeah, that would be great. Um, the Situate Town Library is committed to three principles. One, we strive to support the evolving cultural and educational needs of the people of Situate by offering a broad range of professionally developed and easily accessible collections, innovative programs and services, and a repository of information on the heritage of our town. Two, we acquire and maintain books and other materials in a variety of media while offering technological resources, all to support lifelong learning, enrichment, and enjoyment. Three, we endeavor to provide and maintain this vital resource now and in the future as a modern, safe, and welcoming community center for individuals of all ages and abilities. And um, any questions from the board concerning any of the goals? <coughs> from advisory, any questions on their goals and objectives just from our packets at all? All right. And turning to the, the numbers, your, your request ultimately was for like 953,000 recommended by town administrators about 940,000 so it's a difference of about $13,000 um, questions from the board with respect to the numbers not with respect to the numbers but just a question in general about sure. the operation Kathy as you know and your third mission statement here is we endeavor to provide etc cetera, etc cetera, a welcoming community center and so on and I've always long maintained that the library is a real central aspect of the town, as you know. Um, how are you doing on security and having enough people there, you know, when Gates lets out and the high school lets out? Because I know a lot of, a lot of youths go to the library to do their schoolwork and to, um, you know, do other things and so on. And, and you do such a good thing, and that's where the library is really critical, above and beyond books. I don't mean people just hanging out talking, but... I mean, getting their work done as, a, as things, and it's, I just very want to make sure that's really taken care of. Well, it's one of the staffing issues, and it's something we, you know, we are very concerned about. Um, because of the level of staffing that was improved back in 2007, our problems along this level have reduced, have been reduced dramatically. There's transitions. When school first starts, we have another new group of students. However, um, because of the trained staff we have, it, there's a, a transition period, but in general, um, behavior is not a critical issue. Good. We do after school homework activities. Um, we engage the Gates students as well as high school students in volunteer efforts. We have students who, who conduct programs for younger students. Uh, older students run the homework activity program. We have a new Latin league um, that's run by older students for younger students. So we find a way to incorporate the kids into our activities and therefore they're part of our team and tend to view themselves that way. And we also view them that way. Um, so there was a short transition period and there probably will be one every year, but in general, um, they're actually a help to us. Oh, that's great. Good to hear. Thanks. I see the difference. It, it appears to be that um, subscriptions were one area being cut back. Mm -hmm. Equipment, which was cut in half um, from um, 6000 to 3000 I, I assume the equipment, is that just like copiers or what? Um, what well, most of that, and I'm sure every department has the same issue, although our computers are really heavily used, especially the ones for the public. We're just trying to proact because we have 30 computers. Um, I was was trying to replace 20% um, a year, so it would be over five years, but at, at, at $3,000 a year, it would be more over 10 years. And then the other issue was just printing. Printing costs for about $4,000 difference. Printing, we're, you know, as people know, we're trying to transition somewhat away from print sources and do more online. Um, we're, we are doing that all along. We're looking into a new email program so people can sign up for email notification of our programs rather than have so many print forms to send out. Any other questions from the board? Just one other quick comment and 
it's a long meeting, so I'll go. To, but just the fact that you're doing a feasibility study right now to really look at the facilities and see what the what we have and what we can use and, and how we can expand on it. So, um, you know, that's definitely a step in the right direction in terms of forward thinking for the uh, facility. So, mm -hmm. congratulations on that. Thank you. Questions from um, advisory at all? Kathy, just one on, on revenue. It seems to be. Well, there, some of it is a sign of the economy. State aid, of course, has been cut for several years, um, and we <coughs> we assume it's going to stay at that 30 percent reduction this year. <coughs> but we don't know for sure. Um, the friends are certainly working diligently. We just had a recent um, book sale. But even their fundraising efforts are obviously affected by the economy. And all the fundraising efforts are most, they do a, an annual membership drive, and they notice that people who might send $100 in are sending a lower amount in, and they're very grateful for that, and so am I, because we do understand the <coughs> on, on people. But that's why some of those of our numbers are down. Um, just okay. two, two quick questions. One, on the bulk of the revenue, is that where do um, library fines go? I mean, I know it's probably not a lot of revenue, but didn't see it in there. Is that in the revenue numbers there? Or? It's not in the revenue numbers. Um, generally speaking, in Massachusetts, library fines go back to the general fund. Um, so our fines do that. Um, the, you do have an option, I believe, of going before the legislature to ask permission to keep fines. Uh, however, in order to promote the library and keep it as a free public library, I prefer to keep fines low enough that families feel comfortable using the library and not having it be a punitive experience for them. Um, once you start to put fines in the revenue stream, you very often are tempted to raise the fines to a level that would prohibit some people from using the library. Just out of curiosity. What kind of numbers, uh, approximations of fines? I mean, is it a lot? Is there just like hundreds of dollars? Are we talking thousands of dollars or annually? Is it? The annual number that sticks in my head is around 22,000. Wow. Um, That's a lot. Five a lot cents of a day. <laughs> <laughs> Take my kids out of the equation, it drops down to like. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 wow. Well, I see. What, what you don't understand is if it was 10 cents. Um, you wouldn't necessarily get double that, but you may reduce yeah. library usage. Yeah. Interesting. You had a second so question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. What's going into the increase in the, in the salaries for, uh, from 456000 to 491000 um, Some of that is because of fairly new people that were hired um, within the last few years are still in step structure. And um, those people who are covered by the AMPS contract do have um, a 2% two percent less. Other questions from members? Any questions from the audience? Kathy, thank you very much. Marilyn, thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Thank you, ladies. All right, we're going to move on to the Board of Health at 510. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer you know good. Come on up. Just identify, if you could just identify yourselves for, for us and for the audience. Uh, Jennifer Sullivan, Director of Public Health. Uh, Russell Clark, Chairman of the Board of Health. Good evening. Welcome. And could you just read the mission statement, just so that we have that? Sure. To provide prevention services and to promote and protect the public and environmental health for the town of Sitchin. Um, are there any questions with respect to any of the goals, objectives for this year from the Board of Selectmen? Questions at all from advisory on the goals and objectives? Well, looking at your numbers, it looks like there's only a slight difference between the department request of about 145,000 and what the town administrator recommended, which is basically 142,000, off by about $3,000 or so. Um, any questions to the Board of Selectmen on that? It looks as though that one of them is just fuel and lubricants, with one difference. And that were the other part-time salary part-time salary or no 
from last year. I'm sorry, from the prior year. Repairs and maintenance, I think. It looks like another thousand there. And um, I forgot where the other one. Personnel overtime. OT. Mm -hmm. okay. um, questions from the board? Mr. Murray. Just while we have you in here, not about the budget per se, but you know, whenever we work, whenever we award people with their food trucks or the farmers market and all those sorts of things, I often wonder what what, what is the implications of all that for you guys in terms of? I know they have to get permission and stuff, but do you go out and check them and all that sort of stuff. How does that work? I know you do, but I don't really know the details. I mean, I know you're on top of it, but can you just fill me in? Well. Um Due to the varied um, participation of the vendors in the farmer's market, I learned a lot last year, um, dealing with seafood trucks and meat trucks and uh, things of that nature. There's various um, other departments I've had to deal with, like the Department of Agriculture, um, the Division of Food uh, Fisheries and Game, and they have certain rules as well on what's safe and proper methods of handling things. Um, and I've also attended a couple other farmers markets myself to see um, what they had for vendors and how they were handled. Um, and uh, I do a lot of background checking um, and I have a lot of walk me through what you're doing mm -hmm. and um, in some cases we have residential kitchens which are inspected in twice a year and that involves a lot of also a, a lot of setup of the difference between a commercial kitchen and a home kitchen what you can do in a home kitchen that you can, and you can't there's a lot of commercial stuff people would like to do in a home kitchen that you cannot do. Yeah. And we have to go all through over that. And um, sometimes we have vendors that have um, facilities that are licensed in other towns, so I have to check with the other towns to make sure they have the appropriate licenses and inspections there before I can allow them to have their food uh, sold here. Um, and and on the the trucks and the carts um, we start at the basics I want to see plans and pictures of the carts I want to go over menus I want to go over food handling techniques um, I want to do inspections I want to check temperatures um, I want to know how they're cleaning things where they're storing things where they're buying their their gross food from um, all those okay. kinds of things well, that's good all right thanks very helpful. Yep. Um, other questions from the board? Advisory, are there any questions on their budget? Oh, oh yes. The nurse is part time, eight hours a week. The nurse is part time, eight hours a week. Any other questions? Yes. Jennifer, what's the, um, aside, uh, it's actually a, a, a cold infection question. There's a real, the thing about saying a revolving fund for tobacco enforcement, and it, so that's from fines? And I'm just wondering, like, No, we're going to do it from permit fees. From permit fees, okay. Yeah. Okay. So what, what's a permit fee? Like? It's 100. I mean, expect, and so what, what, well, what would that revenue, what would that revenue be? Well, it would be to hire people that we do. Um, we used to have funding from the state, and you know that great tobacco settlement that we used elsewhere in the state budget. So um, we were part of the biggest one of the biggest consortiums because we were doing it regionally. And we were one of the most successful ones in the entire state. So we, but we were fortunate. We were probably one of the last ones cut, but we were cut. So now we do not have compliance checks happening, and we feel that's a big gap that we would like to see filled. And um, but we have to come up with a way of funding it. And to create a revolving fund, we would be taking it out of the revenue stream to the general fund, but. We no longer um, 
to uh, burdening the town with that cost so we can generate whatever it costs us we can generate hopefully better the permit funds. And we are going to seek to try and do that easy. How many how many how much um I would say maybe fifteen hundred <coughs> maybe. Fifteen hundred? Okay. Just I didn't hear it. That's okay. Yeah, fifteen hundred. I think it's about fifteen places. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Russell. Thank, Thank you, you, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Hey, Russell. All right. Things Moving on, on to 630. Things good on the river. Recreation. I mean that out of concern. How are you? Jennifer, good evening. Good evening. Rob, if you could both just identify yourselves for the audience, it would be helpful. Jennifer Vitelli, Recreation Director. Rob McCary, uh, Recreation Committee member. Who would like to read the mission statement? Read it. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 the mission of the Situate Recreation Department is to provide exceptional and creative programs, services, and facilities, such as beaches, ball fields, and playgrounds that foster community spirit and involvement while enhancing the quality of life for all people in Situate. Are there any questions with respect to any of the goals or objectives from the Board of Selectmen? Any questions from advisory on goals and objectives? Turning to your actual <coughs> budget, uh, you're requesting almost $224,000. Uh, and uh, the town administrator is basically suggesting that you get um, $200, or actually $100 less. So it doesn't seem to be much deviation here. Questions at all from the board? The one thing, I'd just like Jennifer, can you, I know you know the number, but just so people out there get a grasp of how much you do, how many programs and how many people go through, you know, your department? So last year we ran uh, approximately 360 programs. We had uh, 130 seasonal employees, over 200 volunteers. Um, over 33,000 attendances, so that's every time someone that walks through our doors that we're you know, responsible for. And then on top of that, we run you know special events and whatnot, so those aren't included in the numbers. And then um, along with that, we also are in charge of the beaches and the lifeguards and field permitting. And last year, we issued about 200 field permits as well. Now, I know we've taken the lifeguards and put that in a revolving fund, but it's still under your direction? The training of them and the and the scheduling of them and all that sort of stuff still falls falls under your. Yeah, because that's obviously why the budget dropped considerably from ten to now. Impressive number thirty over thirty three thirty five thousand people use your program yeah. on a, a department budget of one hundred and twenty three thousand dollars. What percentage is that? Good bang for our buck. So oh, our percent, we're less than a quarter of a percent of the town's budget, yeah. Questions <laughs> from advisory? <laughs> Questions at all? <coughs> all right. Well, then, any questions from the audience? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Moving on to the capital budget review. And that's in our, our packet. I assume it's probably in your right. packet, too. Um, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think you'll need the other thing too. And Tricia, I'm assuming I'm turning that over to you as to the uh, capital. Uh, Eric. Yep, <coughs> your recommendations. <laughs> Renee, come sure. Renee, come on up. And more to so we have a this test? Is just a couple <laughs> we have already. <laughs> yeah. It appears as though that you're requesting or suggesting uh, for this fiscal year three million eighty nine thousand dollars. Although there was a recommend or the, the re was it yeah, the request for almost from from all departments of about almost fourteen million dollars. Okay, I'm sorry. That's I'm okay. I'm saying I have someone's <laughs> capital plan, and I don't know. Is it yours, Eric? I thought it might be Mars. Oh, it's yours. Okay, that's your capital plan. Did we get 
John, but I'm going off what's in our blue binder, right? Yeah. Okay. No, that's all right. I didn't. Um, okay, so to regroup. Um, Patricia, once did we get a new? We got a new cover sheet, right? A new. Not yet. I'm going to do that oh, right yet. now. Gotcha. All right. So, um, the capital planning process was changed this year. I actually did a recommended capital plan with recommended um, funding and appropriation based on an objective rating formula. That was all shared with the board and the capital planning committee. The capital plan included all the FY12 capital plans for uh, town and school departments and then my recommended um, projects based on the new formula. I'm going to hand out now just a two-page um, revision. Actually, Tony, that's two-page. Um, just to help you tie the numbers, and we also made a few changes. Thanks, John. Um, it's the same. So what the Capital Planning Committee has been doing since uh, December is reviewing all the capital requests. And just to quickly walk through the document that I just passed out that says updated February 15th, um, it was confusing to tie my recommended numbers to the narrative inside the report and a revision that was issued shortly after the report was issued. So this ties all the numbers to the attached. And again, um, these are my recommendations. They're only recommendations, advisory, the Capital Planning Committee, the Board of Selectmen can change them. One thing that's not reflected in this, which we'll reconcile next week as you finalize the warrant, and Jane can speak a little too. Um, is we have some authorized but unexpended funds for certain projects that we can apply against to this total number. Um, but essentially when that happens, I'll just reduce the free cash allocation that much more. I just want to make sure I understand what you said. So something, for example, was authorized at town meeting three years ago. It came in under cost or something, and so that money is left over. Right, and I'll give you an example of that. The library project for the HVAC system. HVAC? HVAC. Yeah. HVAC. yeah. Um, there's a $27,000 capital request. It's the last piece they weren't able to do. It's recommended. There's still 19,000 left in that authorization. So we'll back out that 19 when we do it. And again, I'm recommending 300,000 for free cash as pay as you go capital. That'll just go back into free cash. Gotcha. So those reconciliations you'll see when you get the warrant. Gotcha. But for discussion purposes, I think you have all you need. So. Any reconciliation will go to free cash, not to the bonding. The yes. bonding is going to be. Yes. All right. So what are we, I, 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 do the items change here? So um, now you hear from Eric in terms of what his okay. committee. Eric, can you just identify yourself for the audience and for the. Uh, My name is Eric Penawad. I'm the chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. Okay. Um, first of all, we. Uh, we haven't finished our work. We're going to review the uh, school capital plan tomorrow. And uh, probably we'll be able to vote on the plan uh, next week. Um, one, one thing I want to say that's new this year and that's been extremely helpful is that new uh, uh, prioritizing system and ranking system that makes the process much more clear and gives a much better picture, uh, not only for this year, but also looking at what's what's coming up or what the needs are. So that has been very helpful in kind of being able to figure out, um, you know, what first of all what all the capital expenditures are and how critical or important they are, depending on certain criteria. And um, as uh, Patricia explained, it's uh, right now it's a little the number is a little bit of a moving target because, uh, and rightly so. Um, we're very aware of the fact that this is part of a budget and we do want to keep the capability of the town situate to finance that budget ongoing and uh, and, and so um, another aspect that is I think very good I think I'm not exactly sure of the, the exact number but there is a two to I think it's two to three percent of the, of the budget annually now that that is assigned to capital expenditures, which is a good thing because we want to have that ongoing, at least minimum level 
of expenditures in the budget uh, for capital plans, knowing that it's probably much lower than most towns are doing anyway. But um, so that has been helpful for our work. And um, I mean, I can answer your questions, but we so far we've reviewed the um, the fire department request as well as the DPW and water and <coughs> sewer uh, request. And again, we'll s we'll take a look at the school request uh, tomorrow. All right. So first and foremost, it's nice to have something in the budget as we go forward um, to, to pay for capital uh, expenditures, and um, whereas we didn't have that in the past. So that's anywhere between 2 to 3 percent. Um, I see that at this point, then there are are there recommendations. You, you can't make recommendations as to what we're spending, or or have you as to I have, you but have. they but haven't have endorsed not, right. them. Okay, really? so so that's this. Well, ask, I'll let open up to the board in a minute. But then my suggestion would be then we want to put them back on the agenda for next week to hear your recommendations. Yes, and then um, and then go back over it as to specifically because we got to hear the school side as to what needs to be done. On, so on would, it, would it be next week or the week after? Next week, if that's next week. Be it the best be time, next it has week. to be. Next week yeah. on which Tuesday? 22. 22? Is it easy? I'll, make you, I'll put you in the front of the agenda, or do you want to be later in the agenda? Wh whatever's good for you, Eric. No, no I, I just want to make sure that we'll have time with the, uh, because we have a deadline to post a meeting to be able yep. to vote. So we, we might be able to vote after the school plan tomorrow. Okay. If there's no, no question or issues, we, which it shouldn't be, but it depends how long it's going to take and those kind of things. Okay. Questions from the board? Just, just a few comments. Um, <clears throat> this very, very impressed by this. I, I wouldn't say it's clearer because we've got about 500 pages of paper here, but it's much more systematic. Um, it's very, you know, it's very uh, driven by criteria and scores and rankings. And um, historically, what we've done here is kind of filled in our um, capital needs based on whatever's been dropping off. And um, for at least the three years that I've been up here, we've been talking about infrastructure. You know, we've got to put more into our infrastructure, and we haven't really found a systematic mechanism to look at it. And I think that this is very. Um, impressive the way this is and it keeps it keeps it right in front of you based on you know very objective findings there's seven criteria all by certain things it's ranked it gives points and you take a look at things that way I, I think the system is great um, the one thing that we have to be aware of is the funding mechanism of this you've got free cash which is um, obviously going to be based on how much money we have left over you've got enterprise funds which you know, sustain sustain themselves. So if, if they can afford it, then they then we fix sewers and we and we um, you know improve the the transfer station. Um, the big part is the far part that's coming to the capital. Excuse me, the general fund, um, which always is the bigger part of the thing. And and eventually, what ends up happening is it hits our our budget, and it's really ends up being a trade off between capital improvements and what ends up being people. So if if we're going to increase by all these items, which without a doubt are needed in the town. Um, the net outcome, I, I know Jane was looking to see what the actual dollar amount would be of this, you know, if we were to implement this $1.8 million worth of capital improvements to the general fund. Did you get that, an estimate of what that was, Jane? Um, I did. If I did a short-term ban after July 1st, which would be an FY12, the impact wouldn't be until FY13. <coughs> Yeah, I'm talking more about the, the whatever. What are the out years when we're actually paying principal? Um, well, that wouldn't again be until that would be two years because we yeah. short-term borrow. Right. So, so basically, FY you can just 15. pay interest only for two years, and then eventually, you have to pay the principal. And it's any idea? Uh, well, the principal just by FY15 got the interest of 390,000. So in FY15. There'd be three hundred thousand dollars plus the interest. Almost four hundred thousand dollars hitting our budget, which would be split two thirds of the school, one third to the town, of an additional expense for all this stuff. So that's really <clears throat> that's really what we have to think about before we start saying to do all these projects is the long term impact that it's gonna have on the budgets and, and essentially services that we provide. There's no doubt in the world 
that we need this stuff. We need our, you know, I'm looking at the items. We've been talking about seawalls. Seawalls, number one on the list. Um, there's a rescue pumper. Ours doesn't work. We need a new one. I mean, these, these aren't really reaches in terms of what we need or even a question as to whether or not we need it. The question is, in one, two, or three years, what the impact is going to be on the services that we can, prov can provide. So that's, that's my biggest concern as we make approvals of these capital plans moving forward. I, I would suggest that that's why we haven't had a viable capital plan, because we always look to the general fund before we look at capital. They're equal. They should be funded concurrently. There's not one against the other. And that's why we have some of the capital challenges that we have, because mm -hmm. we've always done it after the fact. They're in some ways mutually exclusive. Yes, they're a revenue source that competes for the operating fund and the capital fund, but um, the capital fund needs to be recommended based on the capital needs not the operating budget needs. It's just like you run your house, you have short-term living expenses and long-term living expenses for your mortgage of your car. We historically haven't done that to the best of our ability. So communities with successful capital plans make that commitment and they cut the general fund to make sure they have that commitment. So it's a, you know, a culture change, a philosophical change, um, but Tony's right. I mean, you can't have all things equal going forward but we need to see the capital budget is just important as the operating, even if additional sacrifices have to be made because, like you just said, we're looking at a new ambulance and a new pumper this year. That's 80% of the recommended capital. Next year, you're looking at a ladder truck. Scheduled five-year routine replacement or whatever, equalizing the debt schedule over the 10, 20, 30-year period. That's what we really need to endeavor to do. And taking any retired debt and keeping it at the debt budget and not letting it lapse back into the general fund. Just so that people can understand it, because uh, we keep going back with terms. It, I think um, your analogy, Tricia, kind of hits home. If you're thinking about you're having your household, you're running your household budget on it, whatever your, your income is, okay, that's your operating. You're operating your household on that budget. And you have a car, so we use the car as an example. And that's a capital invest investment in the long term. So if you have a car that's brand new, you don't have to worry about it because generally it's going to be under warranty. You're going to have that car than paying your operating of that car, which happens to be the gas. But if you're 10 years into that car or 15 years into that car, you know sooner or later the car is going to break down. So you've got to then begin to say, based on my household budget, what am I going to do with the car if the car starts breaking down? I'm going to maybe, do I wait until it breaks down and then have to figure out how I'm going to pay for it? Or should I start thinking about the household budget and saying, let me allocate a small little amount of money each year to set it aside so that when the car breaks down, we'll have some money set aside. And this is the philosophical difference we're talking about here. Do we, at this point, start setting aside some money going forward with investments for capital investments into this town? Or do we, given the economy and given the problems that we're facing right now, do we forgo that? We haven't been doing that in the <coughs> past, so maybe this is a time that we need to kind of take a look at it. And so um, a very interesting discussion, something that obviously we're going to have to address. But having uh, gone here, we're getting close to the 705 mark. Quick I want to ask the advisory. I'll come back to you, Rick, in sure. a second. No Are problem. there any questions from advisory? Anybody? Chair, I think we're going to hold. We're going to try to reschedule. We were supposed to hear this Thursday, and we'll, we'll hold so we can get into more detail. Okay. Also, for the remaining budgets, we're hearing those Thursdays. So as a committee, we'll hold all our questions. Don't you want to stay and watch? <laughs> <laughs> People are welcome to stay, but we're hearing these. Okay. These That's good. Mr. Murray. Just a very quick question. Are any of these um, single ticket items, like a rescue pumper, are they on the books for being reimbursed under an emergency declaration or anything like that? The and this is, to, I mean, we need them, so we have to put them here, but they potentially could get paid for out of an emergency fund? Um, the, pumper, state. the pumper was insured, so anything we get reimbursed, if we get reimbursed, yep. backs any reimbursement out that at depreciation of yeah. the vehicle, which was 25 years. Yep. The loader was not insured because we don't insure for damage after it's 20 years old okay. or 15 years old. Um, so um, that, again, will be de depreciated down because there's no insurance. Yeah, on okay, it, so we're talking... That's A, if we get reimbursed, and B, e, they, small number. FEMA and MEMA depreciates. Correct. 
Okay, thanks. No, just it's like paying sure. collision on my first one, one quick comment. Um, just so it isn't misconstrued, I don't, I don't see a phys philosophical difference. I just think that that's what we have to consider when we look at doing this. I don't think one's more important than the other. I think they're both very important at equal levels. It's just a matter of if you approve this today, you got to be aware of the fact that three years down the road what the impact of it's going to be. And we really don't have the number yet as to me what is actually going to drop off in 2015 from what we bought right. 10 years before that, which will have a you know, a counter effect on this, but. Um, right, and, you, and two things. One is you really should be seeing a five-year rolling. So you have yeah. all the f out year, the four-year out year requests. They haven't been rated yet because once you approve the FY12, then I'll go back in and do, because some will drop and fall out. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing that this year with the increase in the debt service, especially in the enterprise funds, because we're floating the right. big bond next month. So there'll be a gap, she'll short-term borrow for two years, then we'll see. Hopefully over the long term we can time that because in 2015 we do see a little bit of relief in the debt service and continue to, to make it a little more palatable. Right. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Michael Hayes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I just want to just make a, a brief comment on, on all this, which is I think you know, we're, we're starting to move in the right direction on the capital plan. However, I mean, I just want to remind everyone <laughs> Close to 10 years had identifiable needs throughout the various school buildings in the town that have not been addressed. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that concerns me as we go forward is um, that if part of the discussion we just had, where we're going to we may uh, ban some money for some of these purchases and the principal hits in three years, and that comes off the top, of, I mean, it would be a situation where. Uh, the school children uh, get less services without any benefits uh, and, and less than until uh, the capital plan starts addressing some of the needs of the school. And I, I will say this, because uh, I don't want, I know, I want to move it on, we can have more discussion because the school hasn't been dealt with, but for my review we're talking about school buses, a school van, we're talking about addressing st uh, structural issues to the schools that were submitted in this, so I don't want anybody to walk away here thinking that we're not including the school in this, this discussion. This is not just the town of situate offices issue, it is inclusive of school, town-wide school facilities, so, um, so don't, I don't, I don't want to give that, you're right, to, but I'm like, but I realize the issue is, you know, um, you know, if we means that we need to maintain the buses and pay for those to keep them without getting new ones, so be it, because that means we need to make sure that we're going to maintain the quality of our schools. That's absolutely true. But, um, but anyway, well, I'd like to move on. If there are any other questions, because we had a 705 appointment um, with Representative um, Keating's office. Any other questions? So we're not going to. We're just going to wait till next week for the capital plan. Yep. Correct. Right. Eric, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Yes. Is Mr. Quigley here? Could, could you please come on up? I apologize for uh, keeping you waiting. This is James Quigley. Um, I'm not sure your title. I'm assuming a. Uh, I'm the deputy district director. This is Michael Jackman. He's the district director. Mr. Uh, is it Jack Jackman? Jackman. Yep. Please. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, members, a town administrator, and uh, town officials the opportunity just to address you tonight um, on behalf of Congressman Keating who is down in uh, DC doing the federal business but we just want to come tonight to let you know that we are here as his representatives um, and we do and we're doing the federal business and the people's business as well uh, we are we do serve as a resource for the town and for the residents of the town uh, our office uh, local district offices in Quincy Mass um, we have contact information that we'll leave with uh, the town administrator tonight, so the selectmen and, and all the residents will be able to uh, contact us. Um, for the folks at home who are watching, the uh, phone number is 617-770-3700, uh, and our website is very user-friendly as well, and it's keating.house.gov. So if any folks have any questions or concerns about issues relative to the federal government, whether it's Social Security, Medicare, an immigration issue, Veteran uh, benefits. veterans benefits, absolutely. Um, that's sort of the day-to-day -day stuff that we're seeing from our constituents that we want to <coughs> make sure folks in situate know we stand ready to help them as best we can to, uh, to resolve those situations. Um, obviously, we want to uh, 
start the dialogue with the town in, in terms of making sure that the federal resources that might be available for s issues uh, such as uh, seawall repair and coastal defenses are available. Um, when the congressman actually before he was sworn in came down to see some of the uh, seawall damage and the homes that were damaged in the wake of the post-Christmas blizzard, uh, town administrator and uh, Selectman Norton actually were nice enough to bring us around to, to see some of the damage. and. Uh, Jim's actually been working on some of those issues with FEMA, and he might be able to talk a little bit about that. But um, that's, you know, we're really what we see as our role is um, just coming tonight and uh, introducing ourselves and making sure you folks know we have an open door policy. You can always give us a call if there are any questions. And uh, we've already started a great dialogue with the town, and we want to just continue that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want <laughs> Mike pretty much covered it all. Um, I think it is important to note that uh, next Friday, the congressman is holding a meeting here at the in situ at the Situate Library um, with the South Shore Fishermen, Sector 10 Fishermen, to go over their uh, current predicament and try to find solutions for those uh, for those small businessmen going forward. So um, it, it's obviously it's, uh, it's in the public library, so it's an open meeting. And uh, actually, when is that? That's next Friday. What time? 25th. That's at 2 o'clock. So if, if we could ask both our um, news organizations to both at least make reference to that. It's very important to the uh, Situate Fishermen as well as the South Shore Fishermen as, as a whole. And, and greatly appreciate using our facilities for, for that type Thank of meeting. You for that. And we'd like to also officially extend the invitation to the selectmen if, if any of you wanted to come by. Obviously, give us a call beforehand and we can talk about the issues. Or sure. If you wanted to come and uh, represent those fishermen as well, we'd be happy to have you there. Six one seven 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 zero thirty seven hundred. It's easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, other questions from the board? I, I can't. Uh, you know, I, I know uh, Selectman Norton would certainly say this. He can't be here tonight, but he certainly. I know the board was very um, thankful that um, um, Congressman elect now Congressman <laughs> Keating came at the time, and he. You know, that's that's very important to the town, and and uh, as a part of his constituents. So, um, the most you can do with FEMA to help not just situate, but any of the constituency on the South Shore with these storms. As you very well know, the seawalls are a very big issue for all the towns. They're very expensive, and, uh, you know, given the, the, the economic times, that can really hurt your budget and trying to figure out a way, a solution. But a long-term solution is really what we're hoping for, and not just us, but everybody. Right. So. Yeah, I think that if you're just looking at it long-term, you know, we just had a discussion about short-term and long-term costs. and. Every government entity has to struggle with that, whether it's a town, a local locality like Situate, or the federal government. And I, I think looking at Congressman Keating's district, the 10th district in Massachusetts, has to be one of the uh, districts in, Mass in the United States that has the most coastline and have probably has the most seawalls and the most seawalls that are in disrepair. So that's certainly an issue that we, maybe some of Alaska have more, I don't know. Uh, that's Louisiana. certainly an issue that um, he's prioritized. and. We will be working with FEMA. We will be working as best we can with through Congress, through the ex appropriations process, to try to make sure um, that we're able to yeah. leverage some of those resources. One thing I did want to add, um, uh, we want to be proactive, too, about finding those resources and bringing them to the agencies and the towns and, and the communities in need. And we will be um, trying to be proactive through the grant writing and the grant making process and identifying grants that might be appropriate. Um, you know the. The days of the earmarks are gone for the time being anyway with this Congress. So I think we have to be creative, I guess is maybe not the word, but we have to be proactive in identifying grants that are out there and programmatic grants that might be appropriate to deal with some of the needs of the communities. How, just out of curiosity, with the grant writing, how do you go about um, notifying, if you will, the communities? Like obviously, I assume somebody's looking through the Federal Register and, or the various well, I think it's Federal Register, actually, that yeah, identifies it. And then does your office then send out emails to the various towns, whether it's something on the planning we, side and, or, or I'm just curious. Yeah, um, we're developing that process. And I think what our role can be as a congressional office is gathering that information through the Federal Register, through all the grants.gov, all the different ways that the federal government, because there are, as you probably know, there are several different um, streams of information, right. and it's tough to kind of filter through them to find the grant or the opportunity that's right for you. So we're going to try to uh, collect that information and be a resource to, for communities to identify the ones that are most appropriate for the needs. That's why the dialogue is so important as well. That, that would be helpful because, you know, given the limited resources the towns have in our town and the ability for the time, 
you know, it, that people don't have time to keep looking for grants when they're doing other things, and, and so uh, that would be extremely helpful. So. Other questions at all from the board? Any questions from the audience at all? Uh, gentlemen, I thank you very much. You. I would greatly you. appreciate it. And uh, again, next Friday, <coughs> 2 o'clock at the library. Yep. Um, so one of us will be there. Um, well, I'll, I'll try. Try. What's that? I'll try to. I, I, I will. Sean will be there. Great. Thank you. I thank probably you. will be there, too. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Thank you. You're welcome to stay. We're going back into the budget again. I know you're here for a portion of it. Uh, All right, so <coughs> we are going to go back into the budget. Um, this time we're going to go to 145, which happens to be the treasurer collector, Jane Lopardo, the town treasurer is here for us. We're hitting the real meat of the, uh, the budget. Just to let people know, this is what we're going to go into. We're going to do tax title next, debt interest, non-contributory pensions, Plymouth County retirement, contributory group insurance, federal taxes, the South Shore Regional School, and then, of course, the school department. So for those of you watching on TV, maybe you might want to grab something to eat or something to drink for the next <laughs> half hour to an hour or flip the channel. Gee, thanks. Unless you really <laughs> like this stuff. So. Jane, if you would be so kind when you're ready to read your mission statement. You want me to read it? Please. Do you have it? Paraphrase. Yep. Ah, you can paraphrase it, actually. <laughs> what, what, what we try to do so that people understand in the past, starting last year, we've asked people to do a mission statement, to read it to us, and so that the audience, I mean, we've, we've had it, but the benefit of the audience and the public to understand it. We've asked everybody to go through goals and objectives, both from last year, whether they met it or not, as well as the future. And then, obviously, we get into the, to the numbers as to what they're requesting and, and the difference between the town administrator. Um, we've short-circuited that tonight because um, this agenda is a double agenda because the last time we were supposed to meet two weeks ago, there was a snowstorm. We canceled the meeting. So I apologize. We are kind of short-circuiting because our agenda is pretty long and lengthy. So having said that, if you want to paraphrase, you may, your mission. Of course, there's longer. <laughs> Hmm. Hopefully I can remember it all. Um, my mission statement, um, why don't I just read it quickly, John? I'll say, why don't you read it? Yeah. It'd be quicker. I'll be quick. Uh, the town treasurer's responsibilities include collecting, managing, and investing all town funds per Mass General Law, reconciling all town bank accounts, reconciling cash to the town accountant, overseeing all town borrowing on short-term and long-term debt, into fund advanced borrowings, MWPAT loans with all pertinent documentation required, collecting tax title, tax deferral accounts while pursuing foreclosure with the tax title attorney as necessary, managing in all town payroll processes, coordinating withholding, contribution payments such as dues, health, life, cancer, disability, and dental insurance benefits, completing cash management reports to local, state, and federal authorities, collecting bounce checks and fees, assuring the prompt payment of town bills with the town accountant. Other uh, town collectors' responsibilities include producing municipal lien certificates, providing tax info to the public, communicating with various lenders, title companies, attorneys, overseeing the tax taking process, collecting real estate, personal property, vehicle excise, and boat excise taxes with interest if past due, in a prompt and efficient manner according to the Mass General Laws, using all collection methods available, collecting water, sewer bills, police details, school use fees, septage, disposal charges, marine slip fees, etc. Is that it? Uh, probably not, <laughs> um, but it was all I could think of at the time when I was writing it. Uh, my office is a very busy office. It's uh, offices, it's one such as the town accountant's office and the town administrator's office where I really work with every single department in the entire town. So there's never a dull moment, there's never a slow time, there's always something to do. Um, and we live with a very limited budget as all the other departments do. So trying to manage that um, in these difficult times has been a task. I've cut everything I have possibly been able to cut within my operational budget for my department, printing bills and such. So, um, so we're managing to hold our own, but it has been a challenge. Questions at all on the goals or objectives? I see uh, looking at your budget, there's a discrepancy. Um, you requested um, 
314,000, almost 315. Town administrators recommending 262. Um, but it appears as though that the difference is in the technical services and the support services, which I'm assuming is correct going into the uh, new tech person. So that's really right. the difference. Outside Just of that, there's nothing else. Um, well, there's one small cut. Um, well, it's important to me, um, but um, it was a $2,000 reduction um, for the binding and printing line item, and that's a line item that I use to uh, print the envelopes. I mail all the town's bills um, and to print the envelopes for all my tax bills. Um, and uh, not sure what else, but it, it uh, at the end of last fiscal year in June, we ran out of envelopes, so I had my staff go and order some plain envelopes, and we were stamping the return address to send out the town bills. So uh, with increased demands and such, I've, I've had more envelopes that I've been using um, than in prior years, plus more tax bills in general. So, Just out of curiosity, do we, you use, when we talk about like paper or we're using envelopes, I mean, do we, does every department get their separate? Envelopes, or do we have like one mass printer that prints it all up for the cost? Or I use my own envelopes with my return address on them, um, but in terms of the paper, it's town wide at town hall anyway. Okay. But well, we're negotiating bi weekly pay. We have that language in two units already. I anticipate getting it when we ever settle the other union contracts, so that'll cut down our envelopes. Even if you do direct deposit, though, you still get an envelope, so. Right. Uh, in postage, too, that's a tough budget to maintain. Um, stay within the confines of, of the dollars that I have to spend because I really have no control over it. So, but I am looking into things um, uh, in terms of um, e bills. That's something new. I've spent a lot of time over the past few weeks looking at the options out there. There are several different providers that. Um, have something that uh, is very new, so um, that would cut down on my postage budget. It would, um, and even payroll, that would cut down on my um, right. support services. That's been pulled out anyway, but um, so I'm looking into things um, that I can do uh, to further save some money, but I'm not short of ideas. Questions from the board? Just, you said support services. Is that the 42 payroll? Yes. That's and then what's in the my collection um, software to process. Um, That's the 7700. 7, is the collection software? Um, it, for the software licensing, that's the 7720. The 425 is the processing of um, all the payroll and also for my collection software um, to do process those bills. And that's all in the IT department now. Right. Well, even though I had to read that long statement, I don't think there are any other questions, Jane. I think Good. we're all set. It's short and sweet. Okay. Do I go Thank on to you. the next one? Or? If we can go on to the tax title, which is 158. Yep. And that's been a change in recent years. Now it's a um, line item uh, in the budget. I had asked for 50000 and um, that was reduced to thirty-two. We do have inventory in uh, tax title, which I am, as you know, aggressively trying to collect, but um, unfortunately I have to use the services of my tax title attorney to collect with some people um, who only respond to legal letters. And we have some um, complex cases. There's a lot of um, family-owned properties and estates and such that um, costs a substantial amount of money uh, at land court for me to pursue foreclosure or even pursue collection, which is really my goal, not foreclosure. So, uh, and I spent uh, quite a bit last year, and, and um, I'm spending strong this year. So, um, it is a reduction to thirty-two thousand. What happens though when they when through the collection process? If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. As a part of it, though, those costs for for the cost to collect are recuperated generally if, if there's some form of settlement right. or, exactly. or at least if so in other words even though maybe the expenditure for legal fees are X mm -hmm. whether it's this year or in the future the town will collect X at some that's point. exactly right yeah if we receive the money for it it goes towards the legal fees 
um, we if somebody's contacting me for a payoff amount we contact my tax title attorney's office and we get the legal fees to date and we add that and that's part of the payoff and I don't reduce the lien I mean remove the lien until that's paid that's full. Right. it's like a foreclosure in to, to bring the mortgage current you got to pay the amount that's in arrears as well as all the legal right. costs to bring it out and I, I did have a one sentence mission statement that I didn't read um, you skipped that on me oh good do you want me to read it yes it's one sentence and why okay, not the fine. last one was like 10 so right um, the intent of this appropriation is to seek compensation for the town by pursuing the collection of outstanding taxes <coughs> within the confines of Mass General Law statutes for tax taking and foreclosure. Rick, did, Mr. Yeah, just a quick did question. You said your tax title attorney. Is this the same person the town has used for a long time, or is this someone that you've been working with? Or, or um, this is um, Coppola and Coppola. It's a firm that's up on the North Shore, and um, it's a family uh, firm, and they service many municipalities. In the prior community where I worked, um, we used them as well in the town. Um, used them when I came here, so they're very good. Thank you. Spignani. Yeah, Jane, <clears throat> when we get the money back, mm -hmm. as, as Ms. Danny was mentioning, do, where does that revenue come into, the legal portion of it? Does it go to the general fund? Does it go to the levy? How does that? Um, it just goes in with interest and fees because um, the payment comes in. So it goes in local receipts. Right. Okay. As fees. Right. And it did, although it did go down under your under your request, it is actually seven thousand dollars more than right. we appropriated last yep. year. Yeah, I was going to make that point. And I'm trying to do things to get people to pay, um, and putting off a little bit uh, before I sign it to Attorney Coppola for foreclosure um, by sending additional letters and um, to try and get some money or at least get people to contact me, which. Um, oftentimes that's the problem they hesitate to get in touch with me when it's the best thing they can do so we can make some payment arrangements if need be so, so people understand once it gets sent over to the legal and then they're going to be paying not only what they owe mm -hmm. but they're going to be paying more in legal fees and right. there's no way of stopping mm -hmm. it so better that if there are problems to contact your office directly to try to work something out in a payment plan exactly than to have it sent out so mm -hmm. <coughs> that makes sense so that's very important Jane that you do work out Things with payment plans yes. with people, so reasonable call. Yes. payment plan. Any other questions? No. Well, that takes care of tax title. Seven twenty debt and interest. Okay. It's kind of a big fold. <coughs> right. Okay, my mission statement. <laughs> The treasurer collector is responsible for coordinating all town borrowing for both the general fund, which is tax supported, and the five self supporting enterprise funds golf, sewer, transfer, water, and waterways. This includes the various short term and long term debt plan options for existing and proposed borrowings, example, bond anticipation notes, general obligation bonds, and mass water pollution um, interim short term and long term bonds, and interfund advanced borrowing. The Treasurer Collector works closely with the town's fiscal advisor and bond council to implement all borrowing in compliance with Mass General Law and relies upon the assistance of the town clerk, board of selectmen, town administrator, and the town accountant to fulfill the requirements of that role properly. And um, both you and the town administrator are in agreement as to the uh, request and the amount, which is right. $1,999,907. Right. Questions at all from the board? Just if you can explain what that is. is that in that doesn't include debt exclusion. Um, it it does include the debt exclusion. It um, does include it. I have everything split out there um, on the sheet. I'm sure you have as part of your package. Back up. Nope, oh, no, you don't have it. Okay. Um, I have the existing principal and interest split out on my sheet here, and then the exempt, which is raised, the debt exclusion, um, both principal and interest, and then the proposed debt um, in the plan for um, long term and short term. I am in the process right now of doing a bond, as Tricia mentioned, next month. So I've um, made some changes. This was the plan that was in place based on my conversations with the department heads back in late November. Can I get a copy of that? Sure, I'll email it to you tomorrow. Or tomorrow Actually, if I can get it now, that'd be great. Or, okay. or I can just look at it for a second. Oh, sure. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Thanks. All right. Um, 
Jane, thank you for the debt and interest. Um, 910, non-contributory pensions. This, I inherited this budget last year. Um, these are, oh, right now we have five. Um, they're people that worked for the town and retired um, before Plymouth County retirement uh, was in place. So um, the budget is what their anticipated pension will be for the year, and then I added um, what they've been getting, and a small increase, uh, four of them $360 for the year, because there is a cap on it, and one of them gets $343. I don't have a mission, oh yes, I do have a mission statement, sorry. This budget represents the funding of retirement benefits for those employees whose service began prior to the establishment of the current Plymouth County Retirement Contributory System. The state reimburses the town for past cost of living adjustments granted through the year 1999. And that amounts to 12,258 each year anticipated. Or the spouses in some cases. Um, could be the spouses or the retiree, um, but they are um, older. Right. So. Questions from the board? All right, that takes care of 910. Can I go back to interest for one quick second? Sure. Do you think that we could get, well, one more quick question. On the proposed debt, is that the bond that you're putting out uh, on this line item, proposed principal and proposed interest debt? It is. Um, in the bond, actually, I, I made a little bit of a change because the interest rate environment is so low. I am putting um, more in the bond than I anticipated. However, um, what's on the debt budget for the proposed short term um, that I made a change I'm putting in the long term was on the Wampatuck school project which is a debt exclusion so that's part of, part of the proposed is debt exclusion right great on the short term aspect of it yeah because I just want to tie this into the forecast because okay. I think I think right now we're using a projected number 1180 or something we won't need we'll use the number we get when we float the bond on March 15th mm. right um, the other thing is can we get that rolling like we were talking about when capital plan so we can actually see what falls off in all the years so when we talk about this next week I know you sent me in the sure, past yeah, a big I, spreadsheet it, it, I don't yeah, want all of it you have but it already it's in the capital plan it's the first section of the capital plan oh in the bind in the binder one great it's out to maturity Thanks. All right. All right. Now to the Plymouth County retirement, which is 911. Okay. Mission statement. Plymouth County Retirement bills the town annually for a share of their fiscal year appropriation. Situate's current FY11 share is 6.49482 of the total Plymouth County Retirement Assessment. This fund pays for the retirement benefits of current town retirees and contributes to the unfunded liability of the retirement system. The town takes advantage of the savings benefit by paying an annual assessment rather than the higher cost of the semi-annual payment that includes interest. In FY12, the savings to the town equals 61489 And it's pretty much level funded. Um, the reason for that is um, there was uh, another assessment done by Plymouth County Retirement and ours was a little bit lower. So the plan at the annual town meeting is to create an OPEB fund, other post-employment benefits, and to put that difference between um, what, um, where, what I have in the budget this for FY12, which is the same as FY11 and what it actually will be, it's just shy of $15,000. What did you call the name of the fund? O OPEB, Other Post-Employment Benefits. So like a reserve fund for? Yeah, well, it's when you know, municipalities are required to do it as part of their actuarial unfunded liability. Some towns established them 18 years ago. So when we got the debt number, there's two Warren articles to create the fund, and uh, the seed money will be 14000 our unfunded like is Mary here? Our unfunded liability is something like you gave it to me today, thirty-five million. That was eighty-five million. We had the guy come in a couple of years it ago. Has to be updated every two yeah. years. So the last oh. one we had was July first of two thousand ten. So we're adding fourteen thousand to that 
35, 85 Chipping million. away at it. Well, at it. the pennies. important thing is you're establishing the fund. You mm -hmm. right. need to have that. Yeah, that yeah. Was the guy came in two zero. years ago and gave us that <laughs> pressing talk, which we decided to right. take him upon. What's that, Mary? No, that's that's it. We're, we're we're moving in the right direction. Um, other questions from the board? Anybody from the audience? All right, that takes care of uh, nine eleven. Let's go to nine fourteen. The contributory group insurance. Mission statement: This appropriation funds the town share of the health and life insurance premiums for all eligible town employees and retirees. The town is a member of the Mayflower Municipal Health Group formerly known as the Plymouth County Health Group, which is composed of several Plymouth County municipalities and school districts, as well as the recent addition of Plymouth County employees. Pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 32B, any active permanent town employee working a minimum of 20 hours per week is eligible for group insurance as a benefit of employment. So um, the budget that I have now is based on an increase of 13% and I used the enrollment as of November 23rd, which was a week before the budgets were due back in late fall. Um, there have been a couple of changes already from Mayflower, but the actual vote, the rates aren't voted until later on in March. So it is an increase. The budget, it's $5.5 million. That also includes um, the consultant costs for Cook and Company of $3,000, so that's a change this year, as well as the health reimbursement agreement, the HRA that was implemented because of the co-pays that were increased uh, in this fiscal year. So you're saying that we're, in, we're projecting a 13% increase from last year and we won't know for certain until mid to late March. Right. Yep. That was, I think, was it 12% was it last year, 11% or was it the increase they had from the year before? I think it would have ended up being at the end. I, I just know it was something a lot higher than what we projected, and that's why at least 13, yeah. it's 14. Yeah, I think <coughs> we projected 8 or 9 or something. Mm. So it, it only went up 6%. Is that because there's fewer people getting it? It's, it's constantly changing. I was talking to my assistant today who handles the um, health insurance benefits for all town employees whether it's people changing from an individual to a family plan, whether it's um, an individual changing to a family plan, not because they've had a child, but because the spouse has lost their job and lost coverage. So um, it does constantly change. So um, what I'll do once the Trisha and I go to the meeting and the rates are voted, then I'll look at this again and I'll look at enrollment again and, and then um, see where we're at. We've already gotten three different estimates from the county. And I think next year it's going to be even worse because the commissioners, in their wisdom, voted to absorb all of Norfolk County as part of the self-insured group. So our health insurance actuals, since we're all self-insured and then have a premium laid over on top of that, we're going to have to watch very quickly to see what the addition of that group is going to do to the membership as a whole. You're saying the commissioners, Plymouth County commissioners, absorbed the Norfolk County yes. towns? Yes. Yes. That was a recent change after I had There was that. a meeting. We all have a vote. All member towns have a vote, and it was put and, and voted down. And then it was brought back again 30 days later for reconsideration and voted in. So, so this Public budget County. is really... FY12, you know, like Jane said, we're being cautious right now, but for FY13, depending on what the experience looks like, um, that's, that's what I would really be concerned about when that absorption of all those retirees and actives have a year of experience. When did they go on, Jane? Is it June? It's not July 1. It's soon. It's part of the, is it, when do they, do they come on July 1? I think they do. Yeah. Yeah. So we really need to keep an eye on that. Mr. Murray. Just a, a comment, not, not a question really, but I just want people to understand, you know, at least as much as I do about this, but we're looking here at a, a total of $5.5 million. And so when we're talking as a town about an increase that's being essentially mandated or out of our control of either 6% or 13% or whatever on that, it's a big number. 
it's ten percent of our budget yeah and More. so you know you just heard earlier tonight how the beautification and council on aging and library these departments which are in direct contact with our citizens delivering services and Tricia and they are working together on cutting three hundred dollars there or increasing hundred and fifty dollars here which is the right thing to do but the scale of those changes which are directly impacting the citizens and these are directly impacting our employees which is very very important and I'm not begrudging this cost at all because it's absolutely necessary that we do take care of the people that deliver the services and do the work for the town. But the scale of the numbers, the things that are out of our control, is enormous compared to the scale of the things that is in control. So in the context of everything else going on in this town about long-term versus short-term planning and this rate going up or that rate going up or not, it's all more than 2.5%, which is what the levy goes up, and that we can handle this. So it's really why we're all caught in a vice here in terms of the macroscopic, you know, situation going on. I'm sure I'm mixing and matching terminologies here. It's so not a great finance guy, but that's the, the gist of it here. You got a big number going up by a big percent. And just uh, I just want to add to that that a uh, year or two ago when my assistant and I were looking at the budget and why we were trying to analyze the change in it, just adding a few people that um, weren't in the plan before and go on a family plan, it's ten or eleven thousand dollars each. Eleven thousand. So yeah. town share, and then the employee pays that as well. Yeah. That's another good thing to point out is that the empo employees in this town pay a higher percent than any of the surrounding towns. Right. Is it forty-seven fifty-three? Is that? Well, like that. Like that? I'll recast it. The yeah. law requires a minimum contribution of 50%. Right. It gets bargained to a different rate, but proportionately, you're right, um, some towns are quite high. Right. Um, other questions? All right. Uh, federal taxes. Okay. 916. Yes, we do pay taxes to Uncle Sam. 1.45 percent. Um, okay. Oops. One tenth of the health care bill. Yes. I don't have that. Do you have a commission statement? I'll get it. It's, it's pretty short. It's pretty short. This one's I great. Have my phone to be the one appropriation the funds the town's federal employer. Uh, contribution that matches the employee's 1.5 percent Medicare contribution. Right. The number we're looking at is $552,876. And that, to calculate that, I took the actual costs um, through October 28th, um, and then I projected out for uh, the um, payroll through June 30th, and then I used a 4% increase, um, bringing it to the 552. Questions from the board? The 4% the, the increase is just based on the, all the contracts and stuff? Right. Steps, yep. all that yep. sort of stuff. Questions from the audience? Seeing none. Jane, I think that concludes your Thank you. Presentation, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the Thank South Jane. Shore Regional School. Manning. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Or put in the bin, whatever you'd like. Uh, well, I hear you have good news, at least for our budget purposes. Good news for this Situate. year, but I just want to caution you, it may not be the same next year. We're going year by year right now. Exactly. Yeah, this Name. year. Name. If you could just identify yourself, Mr. Manning. Uh, Jack Manning, South Shore Vogue Tech. Representative, Citrus Representative. Uh, this year, the pre preliminary estimate is uh, the assessment would be $428,717, <coughs> which will be down $175,702. And that's predicated on the fact that uh, student enrollment has dropped by 14 students which is approximately 33 percent. Is that a function because the students didn't apply or is it, do they get, I'm just curious, um, or is it a function that they didn't it's get selected or? It could uh, be uh, one of many, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of, in my, in my own 
it, usually in economic downturn, vocational education picks up. I yeah. say we go up. Yeah. It seems to be a fluke, and that's why I caution you next year that right. it might go right back up again. But it's a basically it's a 29 percent decrease from last year. Yeah, 32.6 to be exact. Question: uh, it, Did the roof get redone this year? Did the they roof is not. We're hoping to start it this summer. Okay. We're still working with the MSBA. Questions from the board? No. Keep it up. Short Jack. and sweet. Well, I, mean, I was just going to say it was a lot easier well, than last year. A lot Jack. easier. <laughs> well, Jack, I think the main thing is that it's the, the no. budget overall budget was level funded. Yes. So, you know, they kept it flat. The fact that we went down is just based on enrollment. Yeah, so the cost per student is the same. Right. <coughs> Excuse Jack, me. thank you very much. Yeah. All right. <coughs> God sure. bless. Um, I was Fun. just going to say, we've been here, just going to take a quick five-minute break, folks, and then uh, let's get started on I the do. next one, which is the school department, okay? All right, so if we could, John, I appreciate it. Thank you.
Welcome back, folks, and thank you. Um, we're moving on to the next agenda item, which is the school department. And before us uh, is uh, Paul Donlin and mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Martin and uh, Mr. William Johnson. And also, I know the chairman, uh, Michael Hayes, is here, right here yeah. as well as uh, James Strabino and Brenda Bowen. Did I catch everybody? Oh, Rich Heber. Uh, I know I have not missed anybody. That's and all. Several principals. And all the principals. All the principals. All the principals. Good. Well, welcome, folks, and thank you. Um, turn it over to Bill, if that's right, or Dr. Martin. How would you like to uh, present? I mean, you guys help us a little bit on this one, you know. So we, we sent out the information to you guys. I think many of you guys saw the PowerPoint that we did. So I can go over the first couple of sheets and show you how we, we, we look at our budget and then how we build it up at a high level. And then I think we sent out uh, uh, a much more detailed look at our salary expenses by how we categorize them in the school through administration and through different schools. So if you look at the, the kind of the summary page that I – Yep. This packet here at the top page, the way we, we start, and it's kind of like we've been doing since the summer, John, with you, is look what our base budget is, then figure out what the increases are going to be from the town. So right now it looks like there will be about 1.3% increase from the town, $341,000. That will increase our budget next year to $27,650,000. So that's kind of like where we start. We go back to the base budget of the 27309, then we add, on, add in our increases for the following year. So our contractual increases, 600,000, step increases, 500. The average bed grant, so this is, hmm. you know, talking to Tony today is definitely one of these things that people don't realize. So back in 2010, Chapter 70 was cut. Even though they said they didn't cut it, they actually did cut it. Then you had to turn around and apply for a grant, so they gave you money for the exact amount that they cut Chapter 70 with problem is it's only a two-year grant so the grant ends in 11 so that grant comes back on our budget as really as expense because we had people funded by that grant so the expense comes back on our books so that's a, actually at 429 is an expense good thing is we actually kind of get one more year I guess you would call it stimulus because the federal jobs bill grant came out in October we elected not to take that in fiscal year 11 and we deferred it to 12 so we've got $351,000 from the jobs bill. We deferred it for 12, so it's really offsetting all but $75,000 of the, of the ARA grant that's going away this year. Bad thing is, come 13, we're $351,000 in the hole to start. And then the following one is our sped out placement. I did send Tony a, a more detailed calculation. I, I can give it to you guys if you have it later on. I'm going to go through it. But just really our changes in our placements for our, our, our outplacement and our private placements and our collaboratives uh, placements uh, and there was one new student that we added John can we ask questions as we go through or do you want to hold off let's get through the first year your, your, your number then you know then we'll, sure we'll, we'll we'll ask added 1.3 million dollars to our base compared to what the our town budget 2.276 million dollar budget so we right now we have a we had a gap to start with of nine hundred eighty five thousand dollars Questions, just, a, just so I can short. Sure. Just a quick one. So that the ARAS, the uh, stimulus sped grant, was that used for personnel to help sped, or is that to cover the costs of a sped X number of children? Uh, three sped teachers, four sped aides, and 200. 200. In district yeah. placement. Thank you. So people understand on TV, sped being special education. All right. right. Thanks. Again, it's a good question because they're hard co costs that will come off, not like a grant that we're doing something, the grant yep. ends, and those people leave. Right. This is really an operating grant. It really went in to cover exactly that decrease. You know, you if you look operating. at the FTEs, you can see between 09 and 010 a significant reduction in our FTEs and our SPED department when we get to that FTE page. Okay. Thanks. Oh, so, okay. Bill, you all done? Bill, if I follow you correctly, so the difference, so we're really short 78000 429 is a cost to us adding back 351 right. Right. so, so we're this short year, 78 78 next year it will be the entire 351 exactly so next year that 429 will be replaced by 351 no, okay. no credit in 2013 I think is what you're asking we're going to lose ARA and jobs bill so we're in the hole 351 in 2013 one year 
from this budget July 1st, 2012, which is fiscal year 2013. Right. So if you go to the, sorry, Tony? Tony had a question. Well, Sean kind of asked, I mean, so, so right now there are 13, 12, 13, 14 people that are being paid for through a grant of which 78,000 are now coming back into your operating budget. Right. So it, and then next year, all the rest of them have to come back into the operation right. if we're gonna provide so that So in the administration right. budget, I added an arrow line differential, showed the 4.5 SPED aids coming back onto the books, then actually you'll see we're re reducing those 4.5. So came on the operating, we can't afford them, we cut them. It is a challenge whether we can or not, we have a, that's a different issue though. But right now that is part of our reductions. Gotcha. <clears throat> so you bring over that flip over to the next page. So uh, our, our base budget twenty eight six thirty nine. That's what that's what we you know to run flat. We had three hundred ninety eight FTEs. These are the cuts that we made. We made eight hundred and three thousand dollar of cuts in personnel. A reduction of nineteen point two FTEs. Reduced purchase services by one hundred and seventeen thousand. Wait, I'm sorry. These are the cuts you're proposing to make for this coming fiscal year to close that gap. These mm -hmm. aren't cuts you've already made. No, these right. are our proposed Thanks. budget. Yeah. yeah, just one. You're a little unclear there. All right, go. So then we cut eighty-five thousand dollars in material supplies for a total cut of about a million dollars. Just so we had it, we're at twenty-seven six thirty-one. So right now we can add back nineteen thousand dollars, but there's a lot of. I would say you know principals work really hard. This is definitely a fluent budget. You know, we're really making estimates of, on who would. There's a lot of movement in this because, you know, this 19 FTEs would be a lot of bumping. Who's going to stay? Who's not going to stay? So I'd say, you know, it's as close as reconciled as it's going to be. You know, we probably, at this point right now, we probably would like to have more of like a fifty to $75,000 cushion here than a $19,000 cushion because the, that, that line item is going to move a lot depending on uh, the reduction in force. So that people understand, right now the total estimated 2011-2012 base expenses, which is the 28 million 636,000, would fund full-time employees from the school of about 398 people, and the reduction of FTS, FTS are full-time employees, is the potential cut here. So we're looking at close to 19 to potentially 20 people. I only said full-time equivalent. Full equivalent. Full equivalent. Full equivalent. But impact equivalent. more than that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Full-time equivalent. So in other words, point there, could five be, plus point there could be people who are part-time, but that could be impacted, so it could be a lot yes. more people. So, so people in TV land and some people here can understand that. All right. John. Sean. Does that factor in p teachers and, and staff that's going to retire? You, yeah, uh, you already? Right. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard, you know, and it's hard to, Take a retirement and replace. I mean, the, 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 where we're cutting is not always where people are retiring. So, all right. But you so take an you, you take an average like your your cuts right. for your FTEs. You take an average salary and say there's 19 people. We use fifty thousand yeah. right. dollars. I mean, we've been looking at the number and going through it. You know, we use it across the board. Some are a little bit lower, some are higher. Uh, so I think it's a good number right now. So, I mean, some of the. I mean, we're. You know, it's a good number. Right Questions from the board? All right. Bill, go ahead. So then if you just go on to the next page, next page really just takes that personnel, purchase services, and capital outlay, and just kind of rolls it out over the last, since 2008. Then you just gives our percentages of how much uh, uh, personnel expenses we are. So you can see, you know, so the 11 budget is truly our 11 budget. I want to start with that. Our base budget is our, is our 11 budget rolled forward related to adding back this million dollars of expenses. So we added back our step increases, we added back our contractual increases, we added back the, the, the differential to the hour grant, and we, uh, I guess, the, and we added back all those things. So on our, actually on the first page, the million three, two, seven. So that equals our base budget, because that's what we really need to cut from, not from the prior year budget. So our 12 base is really that, and then the million dollars is coming off those cuts. So just give you a high level summary. When you look at it, we're 83% personnel, but when you go through the pages, you can see what we can cut. We're really almost, it's, we're, you know, without hitting personnel, we're really into the 90% while number because when you look at our non-salary expenses, you're looking at utilities, you're looking at outplacement services, 
you're not looking at a lot of soft costs. We're not looking at a lot of supplies and things like that. We're looking at, you know, heat, gas, utilities, oil, uh, <coughs> and a purchase service related to the SPED placements. Uh, the next page just gives you a trend by school. Uh, I would not say it's the best analysis in the world, but gives you an idea of what we spend per student per school and what we spend, where the budget has moved a little bit over the last few years across the schools. I'd say the key thing to note is that school population has been very flat and hasn't been reducing. I think some people think it's been reducing a little bit. It hasn't. We're actually up estimated 10 students from this year, and we're up about 50 Dude. students since 2008. So with the budget reduce, I mean, or budget reductions, we've actually grown our students. So you can see that we've spent back in, you know, 08, 09, we were spending on a total basis about $8,600 per student. And in 2012, we're looking at about $8,400 per, per student. Again, take effect increases in multiple different areas. It's a significant reduction. Um, just a quick question. I see that the total enrollment is roughly flat, but all the elementary schools are going down. Right. So this right. is the year we 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 had two that we are, we had a we have a really for, for elementary parents out there know it. Yeah. We have big a really big grade. sixth grade sixth class. Grade. Yeah. So that moved out of sixth grade, and that moved. So you see a lot of our cuts are in the elementary. Yep. So they they moved to the gates, and then there's a really big, there's a big eighth grade class, not as big as a sixth grade class. And that moved to the high school. So, and then the class that was a senior that's leaving the high school is a smaller class. So you can see Gates and the high school actually grew in population, and that's why the expenses actually per student is reducing in those two schools. And what does it look like two or three years down the road? Do you have estimates of population coming up from whatever in, records there might be, birth records, demographic records, or what have you, in terms of projecting anticipated enrollments at the elementary schools in the next two or three years? For the next three years, at the elementaries, the numbers are in the fifth grade right now, which will be the sixth grade next year. It'd be 274. The well, I can understand that because I understand be, that four plus one years, is five. But how about how about the three-year-olds in town right now? Well, I would just else. yeah, I did the uh, redistricting with Jim. I see Jim in the back there, yeah. and it's really not a science. It's we took the birth rates, we looked at yeah. all the stuff, and put it in there. It's really difficult to figure out, but it's been pretty flat at least. For the last, uh, Jim, you'd know better than me, at least the 10 years, you know, the, the population has not gone down. Okay. Just wondering. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a trend by school by year since 08. And then the next page is really the FTE analytics. And I think this was, you know, we're talking to, to Rick and Tony there, yeah. kind of really pushing us on this. I appreciate you so, putting this effort in on this. So we went back and kind of re-looked at it to get you guys a handle of the way we look at it, but we just didn't have a summary page. So I think this helps. Uh, so it starts with budget 09, and you can see we broke it into administration, then grades 1 through 2, then SPED, uh, then excluding K. The reason we excluded the K is because that program really changed over the last few years where we went to a full day K. So it kind of... It makes it look like we didn't reduce as much, but we re those were the key areas we reduced in, and we grew in K, but we grew in K by charging fees to grow in full day K. So it's not exactly apples to oranges. So that's why I excluded the K. Uh, I, I excluded it, then I added it back in so you can see the numbers. So we were at, at 2009, we're at 430 FTEs uh, without K and 438 with K. And see that during that year we had a significant reduction in our budget and I think people feel to forget that we, we, this this happened and I think part of it was because of the ARA grant so a lot of it got <coughs> moved over to an operating grant the ARA operating grant so our budget reduced by 28.3 FTEs from 09 to 010 and and but we only laid off I think it was 10 people so we had retirees all these other things but 10 people got laid off but then a bunch moved over to the ARA grant out of the SPED. And you can see that our SPED budget from 09 to 010 reduced by 16.2 FTEs. So that's coming back. So again, now that's coming back, you know, this year and next year. So 75,000 is coming back this year. The remaining 350,000 is coming back the year after this. Uh, 
then you see we also we had you know our admin budget was reduced that year. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and then you roll into 2011, right. and you can see that's where more of our significant reductions occurred in the professional staff area, going from 242 down to 223. Uh, sorry, 192 to 100, uh, 180 teachers, I guess. So, Bill, just in a quick synopsis, if we look at the 2009 budget to the projected 2012 um, budget after the cuts that you're proposing, the number of positions, FTEs, FTEs have gone down 67 Point FTEs. Yeah. 59.2 if you if you include kindergarten, 67 FTEs if you don't include the changes in kindergarten. And this is the reason because. I was saying 67, 70 in my presentations, but when we go and actually look at FTEs in the school, they're down 59. So the really reconciliation piece of it is we grew K, we charged and we grew K, right. kindergarten. And to, to point that out a little bit more is of the 59 or six, you know, whatever you want to average at two, 32 of them are professional teachers. Right. So those are classroom teachers, not, you know, you, I assume you cut aides first and custodial second and then you got to the point where there's actually 32 teacher positions that have been cut so last year we reduced 24.7 FTEs um, I'm not sure if this is the or, I'm sorry Tony oh, go ahead yeah. John may I speak yes um, I'm not sure this is the best place to, to bring it up and I don't want to get in too, too much detail but I really do appreciate the personnel breakdown here also by the schools that you did um, and I'm looking at all these numbers, and I, I don't mean at all any uh, disrespect to administration, particularly because I am an administrator myself at Boston University in addition to teaching. But I, I do note that the um, administration seems to be down a lot less than some of these other capacities that we're looking at. Is that accurate? In particular, I'm looking at same amount of department heads, same amount of administration. I mean administration above the double line there, not just the administration line within the administration group. But I mean, and I'm just, but if you, if I'm you, just wondering what's going on there. So you know, if you look at that number, you say 12, right? Okay. Yeah, say you, 12. Yeah. Right, so it's 12. Right. Then if you go into each one of the budgets, right. you know, we have three at the high school, one at all the other schools. What, what do department heads do? The department heads are actually teachers. Okay, do they teach? Are department heads in the classroom as so well? The yes. portion that... Okay. The 5.3 of the FDE here is the part that they're they're responsible for addressing curriculum across the across the okay. uh, one through 12. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So that's the responsibility. So we put they're in that number because if you look in the admin, yep, they're under Jim Kelleher and his curriculum area where they're working on all the MCAS rollouts, mm -hmm. all the stuff. I mean, this is all the stuff that we did part of the over. Yeah, right. right. Sure. Great right department heads. You know, the vision of one through 12, <laughs> align the curriculum. Yeah. The back. yeah, and I know there's a lot of work there. I, I, right. I do appreciate well, they that. They do teach. Yeah, uh, just so a rough question, and I know this is probably unanswerable, and there's a lot of latitude in this answer, but a typical teacher is teaching X number of classes, and a typical department head is teaching X number of classes. How much is that difference? In other words, how much less teaching is a department head doing? Is a department head doing 90% of the same teaching as a regular teacher, or 50%, or 10 percent as a regular teacher it vary, it and it's going to vary all over the place but just just a, i need a rough you know a rough the major boundary. the major ones mathematics english and social studies paul, are point wait, two wait, wait, paul, hold on oh, I oh, okay. hold on right. hold on everybody okay yeah. hold on all right dr martin you want to have that if you could please clarify that all right for us. Responsibilities K to 12, they teach two, and for the departments that do not have MCAS responsibilities, they teach three. Great, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, and just so you know where I'm coming from, that seems to make sense to me. That makes that lines up with what my expectations would be. Chairman Hayes. And just so you know, Rick, uh, the uh, department heads our contractual obligations. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So, it, 
So if you look across, you can see where we added the, the base budget to, uh, onto the SPED, the 4.5 came back, and then yeah. actually ended up getting eliminated again. Yeah. Uh, and then so the total cuts that we're proposing related to FTEs this year are the 19.2, 18.7 the plus the 0.5 kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So that's the total uh, cumulative over the last three years of 67.2 positions that we reduced from the school system. Questions from the board? That, that didn't sound clear, if I may, John. Sure. Jamie? 67.2 <laughs> in the last two years. Didn't, you know, as we discussed, override the support town wide and school wide. That's a, that's a significant number. And as Bill said, in the first year, you might not have noticed some of, some of the grants, are coming, but the grants are going away. And there's nothing backing them up. And another 19 on top. So as it rolls out, the percentages are here. It's 15% of our teachers and staff have been cut in the last four fiscal years. Is that right? 15.6 on the far right? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> and, you know, just to be clear, these are not vacant positions. These are real positions. But as you guys know, looking at our our unemployment costs, they're up significantly because these are real layoffs, real rifts, creating a lot of bumping and a lot of challenges for Dr. Mark in our first two years there. And if I understand this correctly, not to roll a year bleaker forward, but in 13, there's going to be another 351 thousand dollars worth of people that have to come into this that potentially could be so it's, like I said you know we can do the numbers we did them last year at the same time we can do them now our gap next year will be five hundred eight hundred thousand dollars you tell me what our revenue is going to be and I can tell you what our gap is going to be it's not you know there's nothing here that's you know extra so it's you know you add on the step increases next year the contract contractual wise the contract goes away but assuming that that's limited that's the gap for next year. Is this going to be on the web? No. No. Not the positions. Oh, uh, yeah, right. So just so that, yeah, I think it's pretty. Yep, nope, it's, thanks. It's worth Wasn't mentioning. thinking about that one. You can ask for it. I might. No, my, no oh. problem sharing with people. No, I understand. No, no. But we're, lo we're looking at a loss in two years of 67 full-time employees in our school. So the rest of them are the you know the line item budgets by each one of our categories. I mean, if you, I don't. Do you guys want to go through each one of these? Or? No, no. I, I actually I don't think. I went over them with Bill. I can, if I can, just summarize for one second. If you could almost eliminate all of the schools, because of every one of the schools, the percentage of personnel is 97, 96, 97, um, 96. I think the only one is the high school, which is lower than that, and it's 92. So all it is is people. Oh, wait, what, what were those numbers you were just quoting? I the know. Per the percentage of those school budgets that are personnel. Personnel, correct. So we kind of looked at the personnel already. Right. So other than that, as I think Bill may have mentioned, it's tutoring, um, supply, general supplies, custodial, some athletic type stuff. but. We're talking two thousand, three thousand, twelve thousand dollar numbers. The one that that we did talk a little bit about was the administration one, which has some of the other bigger components into it. I think is that the first one? Yeah. Yeah, it's the first budget. Right. Yeah. So um, that only has forty two percent personnel, and that has the oil, um, a million seven of sped outplacement, which are. I didn't print that list out, but it's the list of yeah, however many kids that you have to place out into the school for the blind or the um, Thanks, Bill. whatever the special need happens to be. Now, Paul, I know this got clarified, but this number here is net of the circuit breaker. Yes. So the kickback that budget. we get from the state, which is the circuit breaker money, is already incorporated into this. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can see the Tony, the, what I handed you was actually Paul's calculation okay. of what our actually tuition costs are. You've got curriculum in here. Yep. 
which has been cool. non-existent for the last two years. At $10,000. Yeah, that's right. just the, mo that's purely <laughs> some maintenance things we have to do. We were at, if we were at 500. It's a time. joke, it's so small. Um, electricity, natural gas, and $8,000 of capital outlay. Um, the one item which I think you explained, but I didn't even have a chance to look at it, was the, there's $110,000 for copiers, and then there's about a half a million dollars worth of other stuff, right. which Actually, I, I think you sent, but I didn't yeah. look at it. Well, this is, we do have, so one good thing Paul has done over the years is kind of taken control over most of the expenses, we moved it, most of it all to administration. Central. So we used to have copier Did budgets in every no. school, and you know, the boiler expense and all that stuff. So we all moved it all centrally. So that's why the other expense is a little bit higher in, in admin and admin not, is not in the schools any longer. Right. Right. So that just gives you a breakout to show that we've caught that budget by 25, 26 percent the last few over the last few years. Um, just the other budget, uh, and just see the the basic stuff that's in it. It's really not. You know, there there isn't a lot. I mean, the in the admin is almost completely accounted for there related to uh, it's our summer program for SPED, all the contract services for the boiler, electric, plumbing, elevators, legal, some professional development is contractual. Uh, then in the schools, you can just see it's just a whole myriad of little things. Um, when was the last override? 2007, right? Correct. Is that right? Fiscal year 2008. Fiscal year, two Fiscal year eight. So a question I get asked a lot and I can't answer. These numbers from fiscal year nine to fiscal year 12, as we were just all discussing, are, are pretty extreme, 67.2 FTEs. What was it in fiscal year 08? I was I, no difference. No difference? Because I get asked, because what people ask me a lot of is, oh, the last override just bumped you up, numbers of people. And now, if we don't do this, we're just going to be right back down to where we were before the other override, which isn't such a bad thing. That's what an argument people make to me, and I don't Apparently, know. I don't. I don't agree with that argument. So but the 430, and I believe the FTEs were almost the exact same in 2008 because we got a 3.2 percent in increase in our budget, and we just kind of was fine. Everything was perfect coming out of 08 to 09. Because a lot of that was for curriculum, which wasn't really people. No, we added the people in 08. Yeah. So the budget for people was 430. You'd have to back to go back to look at 07 and what it was prior. Right. Do you know what that was? Uh, how many people did we add with the override? Oh, we didn't hire 67 people. About 20. Yeah, I know. I'm trying About to make 20. that point. About 20. Well, I can go back and get you that number. We, oh, had, right. we had two things that happened in fiscal year 08. One of them was from the 2007 annual town meeting. We got $500,000 in curriculum. Right. And Which Dr. Isn't Dr. Keller had the best job in the, in the district because we also had $500,000 in our line item budget, the LEA budget, the Local Education Authority budget, the money that the town gave us. Yep. It was a million dollars to be spent in fiscal year 08. We switched over a lot of information. I mean, Dr. Keller could tell you, stand up and give you a litany of things that we did. We put in labs down at the high school. We put in um, an art lab at the high school. We put in a, um, um, a brand new lab down at the Gate School for um, um, Jim Helping. But how many positions? How many yeah. positions? It was 20 you? positions we put in. Okay, so that's 20. 20. So 20. Positions. 20. Right. So that, that's important. So, I mean, if we look net net from now to before the last override, that was 20. This is 67.2. You're still down 47.2 compared to before the last override, plus or minus. And I congratulate Jim and the others for having the prescience to to use those in infrastructure improvements because we're certainly not don't have that luxury now and the students have been reaping the benefits ever since then and in the future so that that was good but I do want to make it clear that it's good we're not just returning back to the way we were we're turning back worse from the way we would be right Rick, the, the only thing I think it's important to remember is the override was designed to fill the gap for how far behind we were leading into it we had well, most of our curriculum outdated, textbooks outdated, in fact, out of print. No, and, I, and I'm aware of that. I don't want to necessarily yeah, now really get into. When we're talking about folks, I think it's important that, they, that it, it's borne in mind that that didn't necessarily take us from a great spot and make a quantum leap. 
that took us from a bad spot right. to bring us where we needed to be, and now we're back to. Yep. No, I, I, it seems I to me that, that it, it seems like I think the way to kind of tell people they understand we took a step forward and we've taken two steps back, and so we're in a situation now where we're down uh, 67 <laughs> full-time employees, many of which are teachers, that are going to have a dramatic impact on our school system and the quality of education. And this budget that we're trying to, at least we're obligated to have balanced to go to the town meeting is what we're talking about. But this discussion that we're kind of tiptoeing around about an override, which is gonna come up. I mean, we're gonna have a discussion on this next week, I believe, in our agenda. Um, ultimately, the town has gotta have a full vetting of the impact this is gonna have, not just on the quality of our schools or the children, but for those people who don't have children in it, the quality and the value of their property going forward. So it's gonna have a profound impact across the board. Um, and this is very, I mean, the information you've provided for us is, is dramatic, but it's, it's the reality. So I think it's, I, I appreciate Bill, Paul, uh, Dr. Martin, all the committee members, because um, this is gonna be the discussion, the debate, for the next month and a half. And, um, you know, um, I, I have to say it's, it's sad, but it's economics and it's the times. And so we need to, instead of focus on issues from what happened way back when, we've got to look prospectively and say, where do we want our town to be? How do we want our schools to be? And, um, you know, these certainly can put the facts out there, the true facts of what's exactly going on right now today and what's gonna happen next year. And at this point, we can only hope it's gonna get better, but we don't know, so. Uh, if I can just confirm one other question uh, that I uh, asked Bill and he asked Paul, that there's a couple of revenue sources that the school has also in terms of transportation fees mm -hmm. and the money from, from kindergarten and then we already talked about circuit breaker. Right. <clears throat> Those are incorporated in these numbers. So these yes. are net numbers. Net numbers. So when I look at bus drivers, you said the fee was reduced because it takes into account the fact that you get two hundred thousand dollars or something. Two hundred fifty thousand is what we estimate every year. Right? And the kindergarten is lower because you take in the money that you, you get okay. about three hundred twenty-five for that. So it's the number we're looking at is basically a million dollars just for this upcoming budget, right. 980 that we need to cut. Right, we we need need to cut. cut. Yeah. And the town has to decide what it wants to do um, financially to try to avoid that. Correct. And the situation, the crisis that the town is in. It's better than it was in November, though. It was a million three in November. And that would, and it appears, and <coughs> that is from the jobs bill, at least for this year, it has done a lot to reduce that, so we can to figure South Shore out. Tech is Tech. I was going to say, was South Shore Votech? reduced it. There's a few giant. other things that reduced it, too. Uh, and, and so, so, so the Votech, the 175 is included it's in this. Mm -hmm. It's in the number. The, number the, um, okay. The um, legacy fund is not included in this, though, is no. it? Okay. Yeah. So the DOR revenue is not included. Okay. So that's one potential source not which the residual we, we have to uh, talk the, about. The out. Okay. Yeah. Two or three years that we've already paid, that debt is right. available. Um, this is okay, the so best, this is the best budget we've gotten from the school or I've gotten from the school in the last 10 years that I've been doing this stuff. So yep. thank you for the hard work to get, get it into an understandable format. Questions from the audience? Uh, I'm sorry, any other questions from the board before I go on? Questions at all from the audience? Yes. I have six, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Tony's moving to That's Norwell. Your problem, if the, if the boys <laughs> go, it's no, it's ten, twelve dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for a family of four, it's what twelve dollars. It 
it should be free. I mean, there's so much of this. If there's some way that we can figure out the highest and best way to fund our schools, to keep what we need, and to take, because the parents are going to be whacked twice. If we go for an override, it's just going to make up that gap of $1 million, or $1.2 Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I just I Johnson. appreciate Ann's comment. You know, we have rate I mean, it's one of the biggest discussions that we have at the school committee, and I'd say Mike Hayes is probably the biggest proponent of not raising fees. But you know, when we got into this predicament the last few years, we really are trying we're we're kind of saying at market, I'd say we're leading the market in, in athletic fees with the change we did last year, but that was at the blessing of the boosters, so we didn't cut some of the stuff that they wanted to maintain. But we are up, about, as Ian says, about 5.2% in fees that we, we generate now from the, the school to run the budget that's coming in to offset our current operating budget. So. You know, she makes a good point, though, and in a, in a different way, and just speaking as a parent as well, you know, we all get the requests from schools, and I have children in Jenkins, and, you know, they, they do very, very well, and it sort of breaks your heart when you get the requests for paper towel rolls and things like that when you really see what the which we all contribute, which is good. Um, but you do wonder, again, about the relative cost of some of those things and, and whether, as Ann talks about or Ms. Burbine talks about, um, spreading that out over the town. And, and, you know, is that the difference between a, you know, a, one, a $1 million override and a, and a $1.1 million override? Um, I know it's not. but. It's a very interesting philosophical point that I think she raises, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you guys are having those conversations. Right, and I think you'll notice in the well. budget we did not raise fees Correct. this year. Yeah, I did. And we did not cut supplies anymore. Yeah. Well, no, you have a... That's not that's, supplies. Well, it's What's a, the 85,000? It's, it's, it's a central supply. It's my uh, the natural gas contract. We're gotcha. bringing Wampatuck. Right. Yeah, okay, so it's we're not... bringing Wampatuck online. Yeah, okay. No paper products. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no but you know what I mean. And I, oh, think I, she raised, I think she raised a really good point about sort of the philosophy of public education. All right, folks. No other questions. Um, I, I thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I wish you had better news. But um, this is going to be a discussion, obviously, we're going to address thanks. next week. And okay. we'll have some more dialogue. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah. So next week, I guess, will be, I know that there's talk of an override. That'll be on the agenda for next week. And I assume you guys will be back <laughs> to answer any questions for school vacation. Yeah. Is that, oh, is that next week? It is next week. Next week. If it's not next week, it'll definitely, the, the latest it will be will be the first. Oh, thank you, Dr. Martin. Um, all right, I'm just going to let those folks filter out just for a second. Um, then uh, we're going to go to the Community Preservation Act. Um, is Mr. Bowman here? Are we voting these, John? We're just listening to Just listening. We'll vote. We're going to one of your... Uh, we're just listening, no vote. Yeah. Are we well, voting? No, we vote these at the uh, warrant articles. Yeah. yeah. Do you have, does the advisory have the school budget? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you don't have it yet? Um, Got it. All right. Okay. <clears throat> it's 835, so I'd like to move on to the next one, which is the Community Preservation Act. And uh, the chairman, Mr. Bowman, is here. And um, John? Good evening. Good evening. And welcome. You know what, I, Mr. Chairman, when we get to those properties, is there a place where the, they're more, you know, so the viewers can see them at home? or? John, I think that? usually it's over here, right? Isn't that the best? You don't have a uh, easel or anything. Exactly yeah, one and what we'll do is we'll throw one up, throw one up over here. Actually, Frank looks a lot like Vanna White, so I think he could. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you know. Okay, good. So you, 
should hopefully have an Excel sheet and then a packet with project descriptions. Yes. That's the one we're going to focus on. Right? All right. This so in other words, places everything, Kim? we can disregard the ones that were, were the, the things that were in our packet. Perfect. That's all I wanted to hear. Yep. Yep. Just three pieces. The, uh, the one that was here, the Excel, and then this <coughs> one there. Yeah, these are just descriptions of the project. So if you, you know, they're the summaries that we do that we submit for the advisory board booklet. So. All right. So we're on the same proverbial page. What are you looking at? What are you going to start addressing, John? Is, are you looking at well, which one I, I want to start with the appropriation that we have to do to meet the minimums. Thank um, you. Yep. So that, as you know, CPC, we have to do 10% affordable housing, 10% open space, 10% um, 10, 10 historical. Um, estimated revenues for this year, the, our, our town surcharge, roughly a million dollars. There's no DOR guidance at all for this year, so I, I talked to the coalition using a 25% number is very safe. We got 30.65% last year to match. They just haven't published any guidance, so we're being conservative using 25% as the match. Um, so based on that million two fifteen revenue, 125000 to each of the three reserves, and then sixty two five is the 5% we're allowed to vote for CPC administrative expenses. Okay. So if we could, that's sort of the, the, the first order of business. Okay. Right. Everybody got that? Okay. And that administrative expenses is used for things like appraisals of the open space when people come to you with projects and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it, it, it pays for, um, you know, Karen, who's our assistant, it pays for appraisals that we'll do when we're negotiating with people, we'll, we'll order appraisals. Um, it pays for, you know, when we need different maps or support things for properties, we, we use it out of administrative. But generally out of, you know, a sixty or $70,000 administrative budget, we're <coughs> returning forty or fifty to the general fund we spend. You know, 20 to 30 of it tops. So generally, you know, I, I would bet 60 to 70 percent, if not more, goes back to the general fund. Um, and when I say general fund, I'm talking our general fund, not our general, not fund. your general fund. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I don't know how. I, I mean, are we going to make motions on each of these, or do you? You don't have to do that. Tonight? I don't think we have to tonight. Okay. I think it's just a matter okay. of going through, explaining it to us, correct, Tricia? Right. And then that's all. Just kind of inform us of what. Sure. What have you folks been doing the past year? <laughs> it was nice to see you and Mr. Murray the other night. It was very, very thank nice. Thank you very much for I coming. I, don't, I didn't really. Um, okay, so the, the first project, if, we, if we're if we okay with the reserves and that sort of mandatory stuff, is um, the Lawson Gate pillar restoration. So the Lawson Gates are on Branch Street. The, the gates themselves have been restored except for the short pillars. Um, the, the gates were restored in 01 to 04. The pillars weren't restored because they didn't necessarily need it at that point. They do need it now. This is just a total restoration of all the moldings, repaint, you know, restore those pillars before they deteriorate so much that they can't be restored. It's a $10,000 project budget. The historical society typically contributes 10 to 20 percent of every project they propose. Again, they're contributing, you know, $1,000 or 10 percent of this project. Only, only comment I have on that is I wish the town hadn't bought it. I wish they had stepped, kept it with the condominium association because, in essence, and this is not with you folks or anything, but they should be paying for it in the upkeep because it benefits them. Sure. So we have no. It fits there. with that fence and everything totally else that's theirs, and all of a sudden you own the gate. Yeah, and so and it's maintain. you know. And I can understand because of the the estate. It's beautiful. It looks great. But in any event, any, I wish there was a way we could sell it to. Ask them if they want it back. Dollar. Yeah. yeah. Questions well, from the board on that at all? Or? Just one more thing, John. Since you and I worked <coughs> real hard on the establishment of a commission several years ago, they've been involved in this. And as you can see in the narrative that they've, they're, um, they're in discussion as the town board with the state board as well about this. And so there's a good synergy on this one. Good stuff. And again, it was a project recommended by the Historical Commission as well. They, you know, they rate them as a pretty for both the commission and the society right both. so the society was the applicant the commission actually doug smith's going to submit to have it added to situ its inventory of historic structures with you know the, the mass historical commission so um, they endorse the project as well all right are there any other questions on that at all questions from the audience 
the second one, the Ellis House. Update. The Ellis House. Um, this is a, a total project of $7,000. The Ellis House, as you know, is owned by the Town of Situate, um, leased, occupied by the Situate Arts Association. Um, basically, this is to, to get a, a survey updated preservation plan that will allow them to prioritize repairs that need to be made. So certain items of, in that plan will qualify for grant funding. It, it will let them seek grant funding for it. Um, they've obtained $4,000 on their own from um, other grants towards a $7,000 project. They're going to contribute the expenses of the consultant, the, the per diem. So we voted to assist them with a $3,000 um, approval. And, and basically what it does, I think, for the town, if, if, if that house was empty, I, I can guarantee you it would cost the town more than $3,000 to maintain the home. And, and they've kept it viable. I mean, and I think they're improving it slowly over time at, you know, minimal, <coughs> no expense to the town. We put, we gave them $2,500 last year, 3000 this year. They, they work pretty hard over there to, you know, and, and don't ask for a lot. So um, we thought it was worthwhile. And, and it does qualify as, as historically significant. It's just that I think the actual restoration funds are, are pretty significant if we were to un undertake it. So questions from the board? So, John, this building the town owns and insures. So theoretically, this is just a study to tell them what needs to be done? They have a study from 1988. This is an update of that study okay. that will they'll bring a current of what needs to be done, and then certain segments of it will qualify for different grants. That okay. We suggested, Mass Historical Commission suggested, they get this updated so they could submit for certain grants. OK, thanks. Good. OK. Um, number three. Number three on your list. Seawall. The lighthouse seawall. Um, you know, uh, the, the lighthouse has, has suffered some damage like other areas. The, the stone revetment that protects the lighthouse, I guess, over the years has been lifted and moved and deteriorated. So there, there's some compelling need for design of a combination of, I don't know if it's a seawall or revetment or a combination of the two. Um, so the <coughs> idea of this project is to fund a, a two-phased approach, up to $50,000 for a conceptual design of what we need to do to protect the seawall, whether it's seawall, protect the lighthouse, whether it's seawall revetment combination. Um, and then once that study comes back, to, to basically put together an RFP, bid it, and, and see what the cost is, um, and th they have to come back before the CPC. We have to be very careful to make sure that we're doing a design that protects the lighthouse. As much as I understand there's <laughs> other seawalls in town, we're only allowed to fix seawalls and revetments that protect either open space or historic assets, things like that, that we're allowed to do. So um, assuming that it, it can be done within a project budget, then it'll allow the work to proceed. And we could have done it, just approved a study, and then waited till next year. I mean, we, we really wanted to get some funding into it so that it, it could get done as soon as possible so that we don't have another storm like we had over Christmas and find out there's more significant damage that we could have prevented. I, I know this is, I, I believe from reading it, I'm assuming it's directly in front of the Lighthouse Tower itself. In the past two storms, the granite stones have been shifting up and down, so there's significant under ro erosion underneath those stones somewhere. So this would be a long-term fix because sure. we've been spending money, or at least the Historic Commission has been spending money from the MBTA funds to try to fix it, but it's it's not working. Or clean up. And, yeah, and to clean up. So that will always probably be there, but at least, you know, at least for the building itself and the integrity to maintain it, yeah, I could see why. And you know. Historical Society did have an application in for 110000 that they would throw <coughs> with, which was much more of a <coughs> Let's do something right now that might have been less than a long-term fix. We decided to go with the let's let's fix. not throw a hundred thousand yeah. at it and find out we're right. doing it again in five years. So, Makes sense. questions from the board? If I could just add a comment. Sure. Just uh, Trisha and Casey and Kevin Cafferty in particular worked really hard putting this together, and I know this board knows it, but I want people out in the audience to know that. The town really worked well with the Community Preservation Committee on, on making sure this is done right and looking out for the seawall and the historical assets. So I just wanted to draw that, draw that attention and thank them for doing so. Oh, no, and I, I know we'll say we, we put them through their paces to make sure that we were, you know, getting the information we needed to 
Well, again, it, it, they're they're an applicant like any other applicant. We didn't treat it any differently because it was the town. Yep. So it, 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 you know, <coughs> nobody was going to vote it until we were sure it was right, and I, I think we got it right. So, okay. number four, Crosby property acquisition. Crosby property. Um, the Crosby property is uh, approximately 48 acres. It's in the west end. It abuts what we. Uh, as a matter of fact, Frank, if you would. Uh, yeah, and Frankie, you want to hand these maybe up and then, uh, so it, it's much easier to depict if you take a look at these colored maps. Um, Thank you, Frank. It's off of Clapp Road. It, it directly abuts what we already own as um, conservation land, which is the Appleton Field. Um, it, it provides access to Appleton Field. So as part of what the Crosby family wants is that the town currently goes over property owned by the Crosbys to get to Appleton Field that we're not acquiring. So that, that parcel up top to the left, Frank, that's not red. What we, but we have access to Appleton Field t through their parcel. They want us to shift the access over to the red parcels that we're buying. Can you point so to Appleton Field, please? That, that tr Christmas tree yeah, down the bottom? Right I know where it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> is that where um, <laughs> Vinnie Buecher? Yeah. Um, yeah, the yeah. Arms, <laughs> arms. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but the, re the reality is we have an easement to go over the right of way. So even though the owner wants it to be shifted. Well, that's part right of what they over. want is the deal. I mean, it, we, we've budgeted into this the cost of permitting and constructing a right of way along the border of this property um, to the tune of some, it, it's, it's in this proposal for $75,000. Um, so, so we can actually, we provided for that right of way relocation. Hold on. Okay. Let me clarify this. Now. So in other words, who's, who's, asking us to move the right of way the cross Crosby's. okay so they own the right of way and then they're saying that we're going to move the right of way onto the property that they're we're selling to them that we're buying from them we right own, we own the right of way we own the right of way over their property right but okay and it's property that we're not acquiring right i understand that and they want us to move it to the property that's in red to get to appleton field and that's their land that we are buying from them More correct than the so is there a trade-off for the easement? Or are we going to have to put a road in to get to Appleton? In other words, there, there's basically yeah, it's it's a it's a path. It's not a it's not a full-blown road, but there's seventy-five thousand dollars in here to construct it. I'm only asking because I'm what I'm trying to clarify yep. is, the town has an easement to a field that it has every right to cross cross and, and I don't know if it's a road. I, I actually don't recall what it is. I call it a cut path. It's, it's a very path. narrow. Yeah. So, we're not going to have to tear down trees, build a road. Or build a path that's going to cost the town more money in order to access Appleton Field. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? In other can words, I, can I explain? And, and the sure. reason I'm saying it is that first we're buying land from them to pay them money to, for the for, for the field, but then are we going to incur an additional cost in order to gain access to it? We, presently, to access Appleton Field, we have an easement right. that goes through their property to Appleton Field, and, and it's essentially an old cart path. There's a lot of ancient ways, as they call them, in the West End. So right now, there's a very narrow path that passes very close to an exit at a home that's already on the in that access. So lim accessing Appleton for um, the residents of the town is situated is fairly difficult to use it um, as a park or, or, or more open space. In acquiring the additional Crosby property, what we'd be doing is, is constructing a new access that would not be adjacent to these homes and sort of go around their property and give better access to something that the Conservation Commission would hope to um, develop a <coughs> system, parking, and things that we really right now would have difficulty doing. But it, it's also going to give you access to most of the 48 acres because you're going to run down the side of it as well. So the easement that's in here now comes in through here and runs down along here to this piece. The new access will come around here and then allow us access to all of this land on this. But you're going to have to construct some type of roadway. Yes. The only reason why I ask that is to kind of clarify that because you're giving up an easement for access for the purchase of land which ordinarily I'd say fine what I'm my concern is now we're going to incur an additional cost to do it and I understand the concept of more open space mm -hmm. 
and I understand the Conservation Commission saying this is great for paths, but we also have all that land that we've purchased north of the um, Clap Road that I'm not sure whether we've actually invested roads and you know the conservation. I know there are pathways there, but you're talking about parking. For, this is a long-term discussion. I'm not. I'm not trying to put yeah. any you or anybody. But I'm saying, at acquiring more land with the concept of we're going to put parking, adequate parking to gain access there, we have all the tracts of land north of it. Before we do it in the south of it, I'd want to make sure that we have adequate parking for the future and paths to explore and to expand it, so that everybody can access a lot more land. That's all I'm saying. The okay. difficulty we uh, have with, with any of these, and the reason we're kind of treading carefully, is if everybody was responsible and, and we could develop some act, like go up Bates' land and create a parking area that uh, folks could just go and use and leave clean and neat, it, it would not be Great. an issue. But that's not the reality. So what we're trying to do is develop areas that are fairly visible to the police and fire so that people can park there, maybe we can eventually gate them, and, uh, and, and we have some control over who comes and goes from, from that property. And if Go I ahead. may, no, so, no. so the, the Crosby property, too, one of the elements we haven't mentioned, it, 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 we, we referred it, of course, to the Water Resources Authority. It, you know, half of it is in, South you know, Swamp. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's our water resource area. We, we fully intend to apply for the LWCF and the land grant again. Who I'm knows? Ask you that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, w but it qualifies. The LWCF grant is the one we didn't get last year on Wheelwright and Bjorkland because they weren't really water resource properties. This is. This is squarely in that. This is squarely in that. So I, I think we Red might have a much us. better chance of that. And then again, the land grant. So those are 50 plus percent reimbursement programs that. It's possible, again, I've already contacted the consultant. Right. We're gonna I have to say one of the selling points for me is the fact that it's in South Swamp, that it's going to benefit Situate's watershed, not Cohasset's, which to me is a much better benefit and bargain for the town of Situate than it is for residents of Cohasset. The only other thing I have, and I'll, I'm sorry, the other question I have is this, because I raised this last year in that, you know, buying land in the West End, I'm not against it, and I've said this, we've talked about that, but I'm like, what's the future vision and view for the land now in South Swamp because next year I anticipate there's going to be another pro property that's going to say another 50 acres or another 20 acres to tack on to the proposed purchase of the Crosby property. So I, I, and I'm looking here at what I believe to be, I assume is this from the, um, I guess not, I'm trying to figure out all the land around, yeah, the, you know, the, the, all the green parcels the, up is above this the, um, the GIS from from conservation or from town? Is this a town? That's actually yes. Yeah. Okay. So this who whole, owns all that land this down whole South area Swamp area? Here is all wetlands. It's all swamp. Who owns so it though? That's what I'm asking. Some of it's in private ownership. Some of it's in a conservation trust. And some of it, we have no idea who owns it. Some of the town owns, but essentially, it's non-developable. We would not pay any amount of money for this. There's no need to buy it. If, if the police were offered over here, say. And three or four years ago, we had all those wetlands delineated, so we know yeah. what's there. We just, some of it, we, we couldn't figure out who owned it, but it, it, we've got the wetlands delineated. We know what is swamp that's not developable land. And that I appreciate because when you mentioned that, and because obviously for, to sell it back to the town means we take it off the tax rolls, right. and yet if it's not developable, then nobody's ever going to build on it, and there's no reason for the town there's to no take it back. no reason to buy it. Okay. But you're not generating any real income from it either. I mean, those pieces, the tax bills on them are $10 and $12. You know, there's just no value. True, but the only reason is then we go out and we say, let's do an appraisal for 17000 an acre, mm -hmm. and then we end up... We wouldn't pay no, 17000 or, or something along But again, we've line. done... Uh, there was about. a piece we were offered along the reservoir. It was purely wetlands. We, we declined to buy it at all. So, I mean, it, it, you know, if it... it this is a, a lot of upland. This isn't, you know, total wetland. And as a matter of fact, I've already talked to an engineer. We're going to have it flagged anyway to see how much of it is wet, wet versus upland. But Frank's walked it. I mean, it's I'm sorry because I got one and I'll shut up. Um, why can't you mention it? But maybe it's just a discussion for another time. Why can't we go up Bates Lane and, and build we something in there for a road so we can get access to get into the heart of all that open space out there. Right the now you can parking drive, lot you can drive up there. It's unimproved. But I mean, no, we sh I would think that we should improve it to some degree so that we can get more and more people up into the heart of that area so they can gain access to it. 
just a thought. Uh, yeah, you don't, may not have an answer. And again, the like, difficulty is you, you have something that's basically a cart path that's very narrow, and then you start to do something that's a quarter of a mile long, and then you have people trying to come and go o on those roads, and then all of a sudden you've got a problem of, you know, do they pull off to the side and get stuck? Does I grew up in Vermont. We had old well, country roads. Mm -hmm. You just turn off to the side and let the guy go, or you go straight yeah, you up. I'm just saying turns, you want a reservation yeah. for areas well, so you can get up. That's you all. know, we, we've had this discussion with the police. We, we, we've had problems with vandalism and the parkings down on Clap Road. So, you know, I, I don't think there's anyone's had any problem accessing. We've got the trails well marked. Uh, people can park at, at Mount Hope. Uh, we want people on that property. We want them to we encourage them to use that property. We've got a, a nice group of folks that maintain the trails and uh, um, encourage folks to use it. But the access right now, I think done responsibly, is in an open area um, where we won't have other issues. And, and and we have an approach to point where there's so many people parked there that nobody else could park and access it. I don't think. Right. Yeah. Questions from the board? Just a comment that the prices here are pre-appraisal, right? You don't yes, have the they're, they're all subject to appraisal, and if the appraisal <coughs> comes in at less, so, uh, for example, on the Wheelwright and Bjorkland pieces, not only did we appraise them, but we surveyed them, so the, the survey actually come in that one was two acres less and one was half an acre less, so we saved twice the cost of the survey, you know, based on finding out the, the accurate acreage, so, you know. Um, and we, we, we may not survey this piece because it's got a land court survey. Yeah, I don't need it then. But, but we'll probably do a wetlands delineation <coughs> just to make sure we're... But you're getting an appraised. Oh, a absolutely. Sean? This, the price for this is 17000 an acre? 17000 an acre or for fair market value, whichever is less. And that's because it's a water resource? Correct. It's also an extraordinary piece of property. It's a beautiful uplands. Um, Sean? Yes, how much frontage is there on Clap Road? And if we drive up there, is that what we see, you know, on either side of that cape? The, no, uh, we're not, we're the not, this, this will, isn't any of that? If you face the Crosby Farm, the access will be to the far left. Across one of the hay fields? No, no, there's some woods, and there's a current driveway that goes into the Crosby to, Farm. To, to get to those houses and out back, right? access will be to the left of that driveway. Just to the left of it? So any of this parcel? that's in red doesn't include those fields that you see no. as you drive up there? No. Can I, I can show yeah, you show me where the, where the existing road is now to access Crosby those houses. The farm is here. And right. The field that you see, see is right there. Is right here. So right now we come in below here. All right. So okay. Area. Why can't, all right. Why can't we, you know, I know it's open space is 17,000. This is what I had a discussion with you with a while ago. You know, why not offer them five, seven? We can always go out. Why do we have to? And we've, they won't take it. I mean, the, this, uh, we'll get to the next one where we've actually offered them less. I thought that's, yeah, 14 or something that nets out to, right? I just, I just throw that out there, you know what I mean? Doesn't hurt to ask, or right? No, know. and 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 again, it's it's just a matter of whether we want to require it or not. I mean, I'm I'm pretty comfortable that if we offer them less, that we're not going to get it. I mean, I, I you know, it seems to have been the the appraisers when they've done appraisals for open space that was the number. Wheelwright, which was pure open space, came in at seventeen thousand five ninety four was the number. The Yorklands came in at less because it had it didn't have direct frontage; it was only through a right of way. When I went to the grant shop for the land grant, um, most of the the, the acquisitions down the Cape and in this area were at, you know, 15, some were paying $75,000 an acre for open space. I mean, some crazy numbers, but 15 was a, you know, everybody was paying at least 15. So, it, it, you know. And again, we've done it, Marachi, we bought right. five acres of, but that was, you couldn't develop anything on that piece of property. And you cannot develop anything here? Or it can be developed? Is you this developed? Develop a huge piece of property there. Okay. Yeah. It could be huge subdivision on this. Okay. Side. Make sure you mention that on town meeting floor. That's yeah, so it, it's upland. It's not, we're not buying, even though it says South Swamp this, there, this I, isn't swamp. I heard you say upland, but yeah. I didn't say here, you say buildable. Right. That's all. All right, good. <laughs> okay. Next one, number five. So next one, it, Frankie, you want to toss those up there? Yeah, sure, and, and this is, 
um, well, the Hubble, call it the fam Hubble Family Preserve. It's 16.26 acres, not in the West End. Um, it, it's basically, it, it's off of Indian Trail. It abuts 16 plus acres of conservation land already owned by the town. Um, the town conservation land, it, it touches onto Old Gannett Road. So you can actually ac access the property off of Old Gannett Road or off of Three Points on Indian Trail. Um, it's pretty pretty tough to develop land. Um, it's 30% wetland. There's a lot, a lot of ledge, and, and at least two of those three access points are in wetland, Frank, I would say, when we looked at two the wetlands map, yes. two of the three. So they might be able to develop a house lot. Um, we, we basically broke it down and offered, you know, 5,000 an acre for the wetland, 30%, you know, the 17,000 an acre for the upland, and come out with a, a combined price of, you know, 13,000 an acre. Um, they came back with a counter offer the other night of 15,000, which we declined, and then we agreed to 13,000 an acre. So, so, so we have done some of that offer less. We're, we're, we didn't do it in executive session. It was all wrong. It was, you know, <laughs> well, I, I sat there and said, I don't know what we're doing. We're doing this out in public, but you know, we'll learn. Um, so it, it's, it's a good piece of land. There's, there's another potential 19 to 20 acres to the left that, that might be a future acquisition. You know, Frankie walked it. He can tell you more about the piece. Um, and, and we got <coughs> an overwhelming number of letters from the neighborhood supporting the acquisition. So, And this doesn't preclude us upon purchasing to potentially put a cell tower if there's a need for the area in that area. Um, you know, I'd have to check with <laughs> EEA on the conservation restrictions. Well, no, because I'm only saying because, you know, what we're talking about with the zoning and, you know, we're talking about Wampatuck. We're also talking about <coughs> cell coverage and uh, mine it because it's poor. And I'm like, well, yeah, the land always you thinking about what's going to the town benefit in the future. Certainly. Right. The land right. you already have, I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> but the, the EEA conservation easements, I know when I was in there on the land grant program, as green as these people were, you, they weren't allowing you to put windmills. So I don't know about a cell tower. Honestly, I, you know, on it's, we have to put a conservation easement on it, and I don't know if a cell tower is allowed. I, I got you. Mm -hmm. So I, d I don't know the answer. I, I, I just I was surprised that they couldn't put windmills. You, all these people loved windmills, but it wasn't something they'd allow on conservation land. How do we find that out, Tricia? Can, is there is there any way? Not <laughs> I can right, call EEA. Do you mind, no, John? I, I, I can I, call EEA. That's easy. It just it, it struck me funny that they they love windmills, but it was they said it's it's not it's not us, but it's just sort of not. The other us. reason is it tacks on to what number agenda item eleven, which is great. So you could have between a bike path, getting to some uh, walking paths. It connects with all the neighborhoods from Indian Trail. Um, you know, obviously it's it's a it's a great acquisition. Great. Maybe with a twenty-five thousand dollar a year, you know, fee from the South Bank. Anyway, all right. Any questions from the board? This was thirteen thousand an acre, you said. Yes, up to depending on the appraisal. Correct. A good acquisition. All right. Um, I'd like just one thing. We did say this. I love acquiring land in the West End. I've been supportive of I think every single acquisition, and uh, but I also like seeing whatever we can acquire here in the East Side. Yeah, I know the Maxwell Trust involved in this one, too. So that's good. And, and the factors we consider, too, just so you know, this has no water resource value. So we're not going to be able to go for any land, LWCF grants. That's what we went through with the property owner. You know, that, that's how we established it. It wasn't that we, we like the West End better at 17 grand. It, it's water resource property. We have, you know, it's next to 250 acres of other land. It was, yeah. you know, different factors. So. Well, there's a nexus, too, with a potential bike path that you can gain access and then have a, a, a walking path or a hiking path into that area. Yeah. Um, so, exactly I mean, right. and, and, and I, 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 I've been told it has stunning that. views when you get out there that, you, you know, it's so. Weird. Kind of it does. Nice, a lot of nice out rock outcrops, and and, uh, and we already have a piece there. The green piece is already owned yeah. by Concom, and so it enhances what we have. And the area at the top of the property is probably where we could develop some parking area for what five to six cars, Frank, up top. Develop some parking. This is um, Otis. Uh, Wood Island Road. So there's a trail just to down the road. So we could. This is old. Great idea. All right, um, number six. This one we like a lot. 
Um, again, this is a $65,000 funding request for a study on the Gates School, and once again, uh, we put Ms. Vincesi through her paces. Um, but, but the study is, first of all, the Gates School had to qualify as historic, which it does. We got the Historical, historical Commission um, found that the, the center portion in the facade of Gates School, you know, is, is um, some renowned architect. I'm not as well versed on who he is, and it's from 1911. Um, so it did qualify for funding. Um, the, the basic thrust of the study is first to see if it's feasible to restore the historic part of the structure, and then if it is, what are the possible uses of it if, if restoration is feasible. So, you know, hopefully the study will give us an end result of what do we do with Gate School? Is it restorable at all? And if it is, what do we use it for? Questions at all from anybody? Nope. I said we like that one, John. Oh, good. All right. Um, the North Station train canopy restoration. Okay. Um, is a question on that. Is the canopy on town land? Part of it is, part, part of, of it isn't. The part <laughs> we're proposing to remove encroaches on Ford's land and over the roof of his building. So the project, part of it is, instead of restoring the entire train canopy, the sections that are on his land will take down and use those parts to restore the sections, the three or four sections we're going to retain. So the canopy that will be left will all be on town land. So it's the canopy that sticks out, juts out towards um, the intersection right. that's going to be restored. But the back part of it that actually goes over the roof of his building, I, I believe, it encroaches. So we're, we're removing that part as part of the project. It, it allows Ford to fix his roof. He's agreed to put security lighting, clean up the debris behind the building, get rid of all the graffiti. I haven't been back there, but I heard it's, you know, just... The reason why I ask is because be, so I was thinking, is the canopy the towns? Because somebody has put things in between, like... Um, sheds or, you know, uh, tacked it on. Uh, I, it's funny, I didn't see this until I'm, you know, preparing for it, but prior to it, uh, the old canopy is nice, except for the damage on it, but um, any event. So the, basically the project would be to, it would remove those sections that weren't on town land and use those pieces as part of the restoration of the remainder of the canopy. Okay. Um, and again, it's with a qualified restoration company. Post, post it's office. historically significant. Um, it's it's at a point where either you restore it or you go get money to demo it. I think is is really the the decision. So, so it would be nice to see the whole old train station really brought back right. to what it used to look like. But we don't own it. So. Right. Question. I was unaware of some aspect of this. I think so. We have the canopy, and part of it, say approximately half, is behind the building, and half mm -hmm. of it's towards the intersection correct right the part that's behind the building that's going to be removed correct is it effectively going to be put closer so the so the the part will be lengthened no. or it's going to be cannibalized it's going to be parts? cannibalized so that there may be six sections now you're going to have three sections of restored canopy okay. left those parts that encroach and are behind the building are, are, are be being gone. removed and cannibalized so the the effective length of the canopy will not be longer stretching towards the intersection? No. no ah, not we're not going to add anything to it. We're just restoring okay, the three sections that. that are left. I thought you were effectively sliding the whole thing. No. Okay. No. But this is not, in, the train goes by it, but there's no usage of it. It's just really a landmark? It's a, it's a landmark. You'll put a sign there for people to, you know, there was a proposal before us that quite honestly we denied this year to to actually start the path so that it wound behind Ford's building and went over Ugh. sort of by Tedeschi's to, you know, and, and we weren't going for that one. So, but it, but again, it will still, you know, it, 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 it'll be a little landmark for North Situate and, you know. Ideally what should have happened, it's too bad, is that the owner in, in conjunction with the town try to take it all down, <coughs> restore it, <coughs> glass it in to at least maintain it to, for the integrity and keep the whole entire thing. Um, I hate the, the thought of cannibalizing one portion for the sake of the other because then you're going to see this little jut sticking out saying, well, kind of odd. And, but yeah. but I, I understand the reason why. It, it certainly it's Can you add to it, though? Could you? Well, the, it, could you? I'm sure you could. It's just going to be a factor of cost. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the, the reality is I'm sure you could, and we could probably take this number and multiply it by three. And, you know, I mean. It's already a pretty big number. It, and then if you multiply by three, it's a bigger number. So, yeah. yeah. To, to cannibalize a canopy, cut it in half in an area that's really not used for it's a landmark? It's like two-thirds, one-third. They're going to tear down two-thirds of it to use it because it's tiled and there's copper. 
and all that to restore. I think the part and that's sticking out would be used much more because it's it is the the sidewalk that was just put in. I don't know if it's formally a sidewalk, but there is a paved walk there that when you're walking from the intersection around where the tow ends is down towards Wilbur's, that the canopy is actually right there. And if that's redone, that would be used, you know, but um, to be used more. But it's still smaller than I thought it was. And the commission and the society both? This is the commission's application. The commission is, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, the commission has told us that it was at the behest of the selectman and the town administrator who said it was falling into disrepair. So, yeah, Doug came before us about two oh, years ago to bring I this think up. Two, two years ago, we talked uh, after somebody had stolen or attempted to try to steal and pull down the they copper. Did. They the copper. They well, and, and part of this, so the whole area back there, and the idea of asking Mr. Ford to put in the security lighting, get rid of the graffiti, is that people use it more. It becomes much more well lit. I mean, it, it sort of stops all the, you know, just sort of hanging out back there. That uh, I think that was going on at the WPA building before we restored it too. So it, it's, yeah. it, it hopefully will eliminate a lot of that negative activity as well and in the area back behind um, Funtastics for example that dirt little parking lot that's the area behind the building as well that mr. Ford has agreed to clean up maintain have security lighting and everything so that whole the area, whole length of the building the whole length of the building not just the building not just the part of the building the whole length all the way back to the post all way back to the edge of the post office now why is he doing that now and didn't do it before we told him we didn't really want to restore the canopy unless we were sure the area was going to be more secure and it wasn't going to get vandalized. And, and he's, been, he's been cooperative. I mean, Mr. Bangert went to see him, I guess, you know, <coughs> again, I think he likes the idea of the area being cleaned up a little bit too, so. But he's not getting any money from this. This is just repair of the canopy. No, he's not, not getting buying. any money. We're not buying it. He's a matter of fact, correct. he's giving us, That's correct. Right. he's giving us temporary construction. He's going to go on his property to do a lot of this work because we have to, access his property to do it all right we should move on it's 9 15 and we've got a lot more I unless there are really other ones well there's another item the 375th is the next one um, oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> this was a funding request to assist in a, a 375th anniversary celebration the the only part of it we can assist in is really production of a historical book that the town can you know it'll commemorate a lot of the historic assets the town can sell ads the town can sell the book the revenues from the book can hopefully promote some activities but so it, it's really for production of that book and we'll place a copy in the town archives and at the library Perfect. other okay. questions on that right. teak sherman community garden which is across the street yeah mm -hmm. diagonally across the street the teak sherman community garden it's a pretty fledgling project this this basically will increase the the size of the garden provide fencing to protect it from Deers and deer etc um, and it actually <coughs> will get them some, some supplies I mean the garden provides you know food to it does the food, food pantry, pantry. It do, you know it provides it, it priority usage by low-income and elderly residents we think it's a great project and it was just a it was a no-brainer for us so and it's a preferred use of conservation land by EEA so questions from the board it's a great project all right 10 community park and playground recreation this, this is a proposed new brand new playground probably right outside your back window um, to basically replace the seaside playground um, which is also out back <laughs> yeah, we, which is out there. back but you know um, a fantastic playground the community put it together it's just it, it, it's, it's wood dated. it's coming to disrepair yeah. it's you know this playground is, is going to have a, a surface similar to the football field but you know um, even more shock absorbent you know it's it's not going to be wood it's going to be you know the new playground structure you see that are you know all vinyl coated etc it's also going to be you know 100 percent handicap accessible which, which we don't have um, we've already you know the police chief and the fire chief <coughs> are, you know we're gonna get rid of some of the cars that are parked back here that I think are almost stored here so there, there should be no parking issue there's no issue with the fire engines leaving you know going right instead of coming out back and so it's, it's been vetted with the police and fire chief question for you on it if this passes when conceivably would they consider start putting a shovel on the ground to build um, I think they've got the proposals for all the equipment so really we don't want them to do anything to seaside playground until they build this it depends funding they generally can't use till July 1 unless we decided to vote it out of our unreserved general fund instead of fiscal 2012 revenues 
So it, it would depend. I mean, I could talk to Mary if, if it was something. Uh, I actually tossed to Mr. Bangor on a few other projects like the seawall study that we might consider doing it out of un unreserved general fund instead of fiscal revenue so they could start it right after town meeting instead of waiting until July 1st. So Who's the sponsor of this one? The rec. situate rec department. I only ask because if something were to change up here and putting in a playground up here, whether that would, you know, spending 300 at this point. Well, one of the things I put in here that, you know, so of the 300, 100 grand is site work, 200 grand is equipment and surface. The 200 grand worth of stuff can be moved. Okay. That's so, I, and, and I did question. put that in the write up because we did consider that because I think this whole high school town campus, when we're talking about gates and a lot of other things, is in flux. So, you got it. Yep. You know, it, exactly it, 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 the, the equipment, I mean, again, we'd, we'd spend some money to move it, but the equipment is all movable. So. And I say that because we talk a lot and we sometimes aren't able to accomplish it, and so it's better to no. have a project. No, so, so it, it, was a, it was a consideration when we did it. It was, it was something we talked about. Questions at all from the board? Well, the only other comment is if you free up that space over there, then you can possibly do the <coughs> softball. So that, that, that was how this sort of discussion came up. The softball field wouldn't fit with the vernal pool. Now sort of home plate for the softball field would be where that playground is and going back into the hill. Um, and, and part of the talk, I mean, the total design isn't done, but I think I shared with you, Tony, the idea was almost to create a berm and set a big cut and fill and almost be able to sit on the berm like you do on the Cohasset football field. You know, you can sit on sort of the, you know, or if you're, or if you're great woods in the back and you don't have a seat, you know. Duffy's Hill. Go ahead. Yeah. What's that? All right, next one. Gannett Road Path Extension. Looking to extend the path. This is... Hollett Street to Hatherley Road, it sounds correct. like. Correct. So originally... Um, Phase one and phase two of the path was approved by CPC. Phase one was design, phase two was construction of the first 0.7 miles with the understanding that phase three was gonna be, they were gonna seek grant funding, they were gonna get funding somewhere else. We were providing the seed money for phase three and anything else they wanted to do. Um, Barbara lied and the people from PATH, I mean they did, they, they tried to get grant funding. It's, it, they're not a priority. We've gotten some funding for some sidewalks, et cetera. So um, they came before us again. I think we determined that we really need to finish it to mine it to make it a destination as was discussed when it was originally undertaken. We're, we're not really contemplating the rest of the Grand Loop, but really that one destination. The first phase of PATH actually come in somewhere between 150 to 200,000 under budget. So this to me is only at 100 to 150,000 of new money if you know what I mean. So I tried, you know, Mr. Bangert, they don't have final numbers, but it's, it's at least 150,000 that's left. Um, so really to complete that, we're adding another 150. And, and again, they can still seek grant funding, but chances are it's. So the engineering's been done, it's just the question Engineering now. and permitting is all done. You just gotta do the shovel. So we were actually shovel. talking about voting this out of current funds because they could put it out to bid right away. And, and one of the reasons we didn't wanna wait two years is because right now contractors are still hungry and still lean and mean. We, that's why we got pricing for 245 on something that we thought was gonna cost 450. So we're thinking take advantage. That's why they applied for 500. We said, no, we'll give you three. And if you can get it done for three or if it's 350 and you find the other 50, you can go forward. So it, it, it seemed valid to finish the project to that point. Questions from the board? Nope, I think that makes sense. Right now it kind of stops in the middle of nowhere, so get it to the John, destination. When you held this the, the meeting and discussed this, what was were there any neighbors there? Mr. Limbacher is always there. He, he was the only one. No, there was no there, there was no neighborhood opposition voiced. I mean, you know, we saw a lot of that when we designed the original path, but uh, maybe swamp, because right? a lot of that work is done and they've seen the surveys that, okay. but no, that we didn't receive any neighborhood opposition at all. Right. <clears throat> and they go on the right side of the street, right? South Stay side. Stay on the same side. South side. Same side. South side, yeah. All right. Any other That's questions? Audience? At all? <laughs> Let's move on to... Uh, the situate uh, lighthouse repairs. And I apologize, I didn't get a chance to write up exactly what those repairs were, but um, Mr. Ball contacted me right after the December storm. Um, there, there were some damage to the lighthouse. He asked if they could submit an application. I told them we'd waive the deadline. Um, there's, a, there's a total of 85,000 repairs. Um, basically, it's for restoration of a utility room and um, a, a replacing a boiler, boiler, oil tank, electrical, and plumbing. 
that total work is 56.5, and then there was they added a <coughs> contingency, and then there was storm damage of 24.5. So a total of 85,000. Again, the first 10,000 the historical society is going to um, pay out of their funds. They actually think that the the 85,000 budget may be 10 or 15 high. Sorry. Their funds are coming first, so if there's an excess, it'll be returned to CPC. So did he happen to tell you that this is an insurable loss and that our insurance carrier is going to pay for this? We had a discussion that I think you were a part of that it was going to be submitted parts of it you were going to submit not for an insurance carrier to to Right, Mima. and subsequent to that discussion, <coughs> the town was originally told the building wasn't insured. It's fully insured, and it, the adjuster was out there with Dave last Friday. Okay, well, again, yeah. I, no, and, and, and quite honestly, I thought I had a discussion with you and Dave about uh, there was some cute confusion about submitting it to me, but there was no discussion of insurance. Right, and I assume Dave would share that with you no. instead of having you go forward well, with this request. I, I was with Dave. He looked at the, uh, yeah. the damage to the building as well, um, but they were unsure, I guess, is it a large deductible and then $5,000. How much the insurance company will actually pay? Right, the damage to that building is a caved in wall. Right, and the storm I understand this, and we've talked about the bigger issue of the town owning the lighthouse and being the owner of the lighthouse, where the historical society has been a great steward. But the town needs to be aware of what the historical society is doing. And originally, the historical society was told that the repairs to that building would be under the storm damage that was deficit spended by the board. And then we found out there was a CPC application, and I said to John, well, let's decide which part. It's, you know, uh, either out of stabilization or it's either out of CPC. In the scheme of things, it's great if CPC can fund it. At that point, <coughs> we were originally told by our carrier that the building wasn't insured. That was his error, as you know, and Frank, you were out there when the adjuster was out there. So all I'm suggesting is there may be some sum of money that insurance doesn't cover it or isn't to the town, you know, the liking of or what the historical society want. But it's an insurable loss for which we're going to receive money after we pay a property deductible of $5,000. So I just want to make sure no, we're and, all on and, the and same page. <coughs> that, that's never been presented to CBC, CPC. I thought we discussed you were going to submit something to MEMA, right. and if you got reimbursed, then CPC would get their money back. I mean, I guess in the insurance scenario, it's the same thing. I mean, if you get insurance proceeds that reduce the cost that we have to pay, it just doesn't come out of CPC. We'll, we'll you know, fill the void. I mean, so uh, you know. we use the 85 and put it in the general fund. Well, I was just going to, John, I wasn't going to say that, but if I didn't know that you got the insurance proceeds, I probably, well, I was looking for you know. money, John. <laughs> Sorry, I well, just wait a minute. So how are we going to close the loop on that? Uh, how are we going to close the loop on that? Well, we'll find out. The adjuster was just there Friday. Um, we have to get three quotes, then the adjuster um, will tell us how much, you know, the damage is, and we have to go and contract for the repairs. But uh, but a lot of this wasn't storm damage either. The fifty six five of it is that a utility room and a boiler that wasn't storm damage. So I mean, there's twenty four five. I thought the utility room and well, the shed was part of the storm damage. But we can we can work it out. Two later. separate buildings. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is maybe some money that CPC can give here, but I just want to make sure again. And again, yeah. you know, the first ten thousand can, can come from historical, and then if there's yeah. insurance money and if there's a gap, then then this money can be used for it. So, so maybe none of it goes away. I mean, maybe it's. We'll figure that out. Yeah. So it's nice to have We're some extra money. We're happy to take the seventy-five, John. No, no, no. And I, but I, I did not hear anything about insurance. Just so, so yeah, it's. You should have not said anything. Then, you know, I, yeah, I, seventy-five thousand dollars. I mean, really All right, number thirteen, a, a transfer to the Affordable Housing Trust. And and, and this is basically, um, this is the reserve amount for the Affordable Housing Trust that we're putting away this year that we're, we're voting to transfer over the Affordable Housing Trust with the understanding that the Affordable Housing Trust is going to deal with the Housing Authority on some requests that we, I guess that we, we, we declined to fund um, because the, the Affordable Housing Trust is better suited to handle them and, and phase them in a way that they might be more economically efficient. Correct. Um, so that it, because it's more responsive, so it's really, and then we will get a DOR um, recommendation on whether or not right. you can do it at all. So I, I'll, I'll happily do that. So appreciate that, John. Just um, a quick question on that: Is it is 125? 
that you're going to transfer over there, the 125 that you're putting into the? Either that or it's the 128 I guess five it doesn't from last matter. year. It's, doesn't it's out of that reserve. So that reserve had 128 five from last year, 125 from this year. You know, we're going to take 125 of it and set, transfer the actual funds. Right. Because we did not take the money that was reserved last year and send it over to affordable housing. It's still sitting on the town's books. I mean, on CPC books. For one more year. Oh. I, I guess my only, yeah. my only other comment is that we're, we're spending $2.7 million. We're putting $1.2 million in. So we're spending... 1.4 million of and, our and if you want me I mean I'll play my numbers game for you a little bit but first of all the the 2.7 the 125,000 is a transfer from one town fund to another it's CPC to affordable housing so we're not even spending that so now you're down to 2.5 and a half we're going to get $500,000 back from the land grant program on the wheelwright purchase so now we're down to 2 million um, we have an extra we have 150 to 200 left in the path that I'm going to close out to the unreserved funds. So now we're down to 1.8. And if we get half of the money back for the purchase of the Crosby property, we'll be back at the 1.2. How would you like that? It's pretty good. It's good. It's very I, I good. agree with some of it, but not all of it. I, I didn't expect you to agree with all of it. <laughs> but the whole idea but of the whole concept the whole is that spending all of this money. What is the reserve? 3.7, you said? 3.7. Yeah. So we have 3.7 in reserve. And that, Tony, I haven't closed out. Like, Al just gave me a closeout report for, like, Egypt Park. Yeah, and there I mean, was this is ballpark. There's an extra 20 grand. There's, yeah, yeah. You know, there, there's, there's some money I haven't closed out yet. But, right. yeah, we dipped into... But if we into, keep spending twice as much as we put in, we won't be playing this game much longer. Right. And, and we haven't been traditionally doing that. I mean, we, we're, we're heavy on... We, we had some good land acquisitions. The seawall was a, a big expenditure. I mean, you know, and finishing path was. So, so yeah, we had a, a lot of major expenditures this year. Any other questions? Questions from the audience? Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. All right, moving on to agenda item number nine. It happens to be a discussion, vote, change in town school percentage allocation. And um, this was requested financial forecast and selectmen. Want me to do it? Sure. Thank you, Frank. This uh, came ab uh, about from our last forecasting meeting, which was last week, I think, last Tuesday. Um, and really, what we discussed is just trying to keep the integrity of the formula that we're using. Um, last year, we made a couple of changes in the way that we um, had, a, had previously done the formula. We took out uh, beach revenue, which used to be a local receipt, and put that into a revolving fund. And we took the expenditure for, what was it called, paratransit? What was it called, Mary? Paratransit? Is that what it was? Uh, and moved that actually into the counseling and aging budget. Um, so those were two things that kind of affected this, the split. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, change the percentages by a relatively small amount to make sure that the increases on both the town and the school are the same. It kind of keeps the integrity of the formula that we've used together. At some point in time, we'll probably look at the formula in totality and change it completely. But um, at this point, there's like a $55,000 difference that um, the school's revenue was was reduced because of the um, beach sticker revenue. And um, Mary's calculation shows that instead of it being a 66.67% split, it would be a 66.81% split. And that would uh, show the increase for this fiscal year to be identical to both the town and school and, and so forth moving forward in all the out years. So that's what our proposal is for the future forecasting for um, for that committee. Questions? So it's point one four percent. It is right. sixty seven to eighty one is fourteen. Fourteen yes. one thousand so of a percent point one four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I'll, I'll start. I have 
reservations about this, and the reservations is the split has been two-thirds, one-third, and even though it is a point zero zero one four uh, one four difference, it, the difference is fifty-seven thousand dollars, which means that that difference would mean set fifty-seven would go to the schools, fifty-seven gets diminished from the town budget. So it means that we on the town that we the town side is going to have to figure out where the fifty-seven is going to come from. On top of it, I have reservations about the future implications because that number can change, you know, because that's a percentage that ultimately it's not going to just be 57 annually. As the budgets go up, it's, that number is going to increase. Um, and so I, I just, at this point, if we're going to relook about the whole figures and the whole percentage at a future date, then I'm like, my position would be, then let's look at everything and, and go through the various aspects of what we're paying for, what's not being paid for, what's being credited, and so on and so forth. Um, I just, I'm not, I'm not, at this point, I'm not willing to change the percentage. Um, however, if for that number, 57, I, I'm willing to at least say, if we have to come up with 57 to try to find that for the schools, I'm happy to entertain figuring a way to get $60,000 to the schools without tinkering with the percentage at this point. Um, I, 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 well, I gotta, can I ask a question for clarification? Yeah. I appreciate your point. I'm just curious, if we somehow come up with a way to get $57,000 to the schools, doesn't that change the percentage? Or are you saying not when you're dealing with the, 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 the funds as, a, as the general fund. If we come up with from the reserves or from you know, certain aspects, oh, I get then you. I'm like, I got fine, you. Yeah, but no, I don't I see want to what tinker you with I, the yep, number fine. at this point because yep. that number is going to change. If we, if our budget goes up from 52 to 54, yeah, yeah, yeah. then that number is going to go from 57 to 100 and, right. um, I was going to say double, no, no, I got whatever you. the percentage is going yeah. to be. That's, that's what I'm looking at. And I'm like, if we're going to have a big discussion about all the things, then, then that time we should address it. I, I just, um, you know, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mr. Johnson, I saw your hand go up. I'm not sure you know you're here, but Sean. Oh, that's all right. So take Bill first, then I have it written down. The split last year was more than 66.7, 67.83. When you moved the, you had made a decision to move the beach stickers out of the operating revenue. I changed the formula last year. All I did was reduce, if you look at it, that's what you allocated. Structurally pull the beach revenue out of the formula. You're structurally changing the formula. I mean, you got to keep it consistent from year over year. Oh, you took 100% of the beach revenue out and put it in, in with expenses and put it in a different account. Then you went back and said, "Okay, Bill, since I took all the revenue out and you used to get 66.7% of that, here's your revenue back." That's what you did last year. So you increased my allocation last year. I'm just saying, don't take it away this year gave it to me last year, and you didn't give it to me. All you do is keep me flat. Didn't ask for a dollar more, just flat. So I'm asking you to just keep me flat again this year. It, it's the right thing to do. It's otherwise, you know, frankly, the revenue, <laughs> the revenue is more than the hundred and whatever, $8,000 that we split at that point in time. Um, the town took out a lot of expenses and put in that revolving fund as well. If, if we're gonna change the formula and take a revenue source out, um, you've got to you've got to true it up so that the the formula has its integrity. If you want to talk about other expenses that the town's paying, it's a whole different question, whole different just discussion that can be done and that can be um, changed. I take great umbrage with you saying it's the right thing to do. It is an option to do, and we're all trying to deal with this issue to try to figure it out. I understand that revenue was taken away from the school last year. But I also understand that the town was incurring costs. When the revenue from the stickers went into the general fund, the town was paying for the cost for the beach stickers. So I understand the revenue source, and I understand it's a, it's a, it's a 57,000 hit from the general fund. But again, you know, when we're looking at numbers, it depends on how we're looking at it. I mean, as I said to you, if it's a $57,000 amount that the school's looking for, 
then I'm happy to entertain where to find it. If we're going to get into percentages, my understanding is historically, traditionally, it has been a two-thirds, one-third split. So um, I, I don't want to monkey with that, and that's where I'm coming from. I, I'm like, if, if that's what we're looking for for a source, that's fine. I think we can find that amount of money. But, but historically, I, I will say, hold on. But I will say that you know, we, we're, we're looking at a potential source of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that we talked about from um, or one seventy five from um, South Shore. Uh, you know, the residual there. That I'm willing to say, don't do a two thirds one split. Let's give that to the school for their budget. We already said with the three hundred and fifty one thousand dollars from the. Um, uh, what is it from? The grant money. Don't do a two-thirds one split. Let's give that to the schools. I'm happy to say with the MSBA, with the legacy fund, which is 166, don't do a two-thirds one-third split. Let's give that to the schools. But I don't want to then turn around and say let's uh, deal with the percentage at this point when we're talking about $57,000. If it means finding it from reserves or finding it from free cash, I'm happy to say let's entertain that thought to get another 50000 to try to lower the budget deficit. And then we'll get into a whole issue next week, which I'm happy to entertain and talk about next week, about an override to try to help the town's woes. But I just, I think m dealing with the percentage, I, I just, at this point, I, I, you know, it's just my position on it and looking at it. Mm -hmm. I just think the, the one piece that we're missing is, historically, there was a revenue source that was part of the formula that's been removed. So if you're going to look at historically, you've got to look at that. You've got to look at it in, in totality. If you're going to look at the historic way that we did it, then you have to say historically there was a resident source there that, that we chose to pull out. But you don't, I think, if I'm correct, you're right. Historically, there was a revenue source to the school. Historically, well, the there town. was an expense that was paid for the town that wasn't shared by the school. So what I'm trying to say is if you look at the totality, that's what we're looking at. I understand the revenue source, yeah. and I, I think that's important. Well, let's look at the simultaneously, expense. Simultaneously, you look at the expense from the, the historically. Who was paying the expense? Tell me, who was paying the, the expense historically? It, it was the town that was paying. Always. It. So now we're saying we're making a, a revolving fund that is self, trying to be self-sufficient, that you're applying that money from the beach sticker revenue that pays for the lifeguards, that pays for the signage that pays for the, the stickers in and of itself to make it more efficient. And, and obviously, yes, the expense helps the town. Yes, the revenue source hurts the school. But I think when we look at the entity as a whole, it's much more profitable. Well, the expense source helps the town now because the town took over $150,000 and put it in this resolving fund. So the town is making out as well. Sean? We keep talking about the revenue source. Do you recall what it was prior to increasing the fees from out of town? The revenues from the beach sticker? That's correct. I think it was around $112,000. Last year after you, we, you had the committee and reformed the whole structure? I mean, prior the fees, to that. The, the stickers were about $112,000, and mm -hmm. then the budget was subsidized an additional Oh, I think sixty-something thousand dollars, because the fees didn't even pay the cost for the lifeguards, which right. is why the board asked that a committee be formed to look at it, because mm -hmm. the lifeguard budget was cut, and then we had the big issue with the sea, um, seaweed, seaweed removal of it. Okay, so we're, we're talking about one hundred and twelve thousand dollars last year, but prior to yeah, it was one hundred and sixteen. Okay, one sixteen, but prior to that, what kind of gross revenue was the beach stickers that's what it was prior prior was 116 yeah and then after we last year gross sales for beach stickers went up fit another we had a, um, your FY 11 budget is a hundred ninety two thousand for beach revolving so we projected revenue out of the committee report to cover that and then also to build for um, Capital improvements. So it went from 112 to 190. That's that's what I uh, take roughly, from that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. And your budget for in FY 12 is 215. Right. 
Okay. How long has the formula been? One third, two thirds. I can't answer <coughs> that. I wasn't here. It well, it changed when we had the override. Yeah. I got a, okay. yeah, I have a question about that right. too. I have to follow up. It was used to be sixty four. So it's I think. it's growing slightly. All right. What's this piece of paper I'm looking at here that I got in my backup? It says the actual split. It's about a half a page. Um, that shows other revenue that went to the school to the detriment of the town to 49000 if the split was applied. So am I reading this? So the actual split now is 7277 No, the... We have to distinguish between two things. The revenue is split um, right now after fixed, certain fixed costs are backed out. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what Tony's talking about relative to the beach revolving. The second sheet is the amount of revenue that came to the town in the last year and how if the split had been applied to those revenue sources instead of some cases going directly to the school, um, the town would have had an additional 49000 under those secondary revenue sources. It's a whole separate issue other than really the integrity of the formula. But it is, are, these are all instances where this, the town or the school got money from the, you know, at a different percentage than the town. Or vice versa. Right, well, it's mostly thrown right. off by the, the jobs grant. Right. What was that? It was an education vote. Which had to be voted by the board I didn't say that. I said to, to be allocated a full to the school. It was an additional revenue source that had to be voted to be allocated. Okay, okay. Uh, we're not going to debate in, in, in that. So, other questions from the board? Mr. Murray. Um, is it in the charter or is it just sort of an understanding that it's two thirds, one third? Nominally, two thirds, one third. Just a, it's just a, just a formula. Okay. Bill, you said that, I think you said, last year it was 67.83 when everything was all fixed around. I just rolled that forward this year. Yeah, right, 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 right. Now, maybe Mary knows this roughly, but in the past, how much has that fluctuated from year to year? I mean, we say it's two-thirds, one-third, and we put it out to the fourth well, decimal place. It fluctuates but every time we have a fall. Special town meeting of balance of budget. Right. And are those are those variations, you know, point you know, on this rough order that we're talking about? No, but just your your gut feeling right now is all I really need. So that's that's all right. Good. We're not talking about the yeah. actors. Yeah. Let's not lose the budget that we're, we're splitting. I, I'm aware of that. Very different. No, no, I'm aware of that. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to. Get the context here. The, the point is, this is just a forecasting tool, a model that we use to take estimated revenues and split them up so that we can both formulate budgets. So every year until last year, there was a source of revenue that was in it that was split. Last year, we changed it. Then last year, what we did is we, f we plugged it in. We, we said, OK, we'll true it up for this year. We're going to have to do that every single year unless you just want to never have to talk about it again, never have to think about it again, and just change the percentage. But we can just plug it every year if you like. I, th I think it's an interesting point, though, that I think John raised or somebody raised. You know, at some point, or maybe it was you, Tony, at some point we need to look at this macroscopically. I'm not saying this in a negative way, but this is a small amount of money on the grand scheme, although $57,000 is a person or equivalent or whatever you know that's that's got real impact but on the large scale I think we as a town because we are doing a much better job with our accounting that the schools are doing a much better job the town's doing a much better job I, I think the looking at this from the big scale is something we need to look at in the next couple of years um, for sure I know that doesn't address this particular thing but you know so I think I'm, I'm with Tony on this one here for the short term but I completely I, I see your point John 
Um, and I would hope we can address your point in the next couple of years as we look at truly what real costs are and all that sort of stuff. It's just Mike, two points. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think there's another factor to consider. I don't know how it plays into your deliberations, but there are coming online within the next 12 months two additional significant sources of revenue for the town. And, and how does that get weighed into the equation? I'm speaking specifically of the uh, the solar and wind, wind turbine that's been sponsored by the town of the uh, trans at the uh, excuse me at the sewer tree sewer plant, which will bring about a two hundred fifty thousand dollars of additional revenue in per year, um, and then additionally there will be the solar field, which will start up about uh, fifteen months from now, which will bring another two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year. Both those projects, uh, the what where will the revenue be devoted? to the energy consuming resources in town, such as the sewer plant, the school, and the water plant, or will it be split simply by one third, two thirds? So it's not just today's $50,000. I think there's a bigger issue longer term that maybe you don't make changes just on the basis of this one issue. You might want to look at the macro. Mr. DiLorenzo. Uh, yes, Bob DiLorenzo, Hickory Lane, member of the Financial Forecasting Committee. Chairman, too. <laughs> um, I, I support Tony's point of view only from a standpoint that it is a starting point. I, I think one of the issues we've seen over the years, as we look back five, six, seven years, our fiscal history is somewhat blurred as to how we move money around. I, I can envision this conversation taking place again next year about the beach sticker revolving fund and how does that money get put back into the school. To Al's point, as those decisions come before us, from different revenue sources for the town, you, you then make those decisions and whatever the formula falls out to be is now your new st starting point for your budget discussions. So I don't necessarily think that that these all become <coughs> one-offs. I think you have to recognize it for what it was. It was, a, it was a lost source of revenue. Go back to the integrity of the formula and then as new revenue comes into the town, you make votes as to how that revenue is gonna be shared and whatever the formula is from that standpoint becomes your new starting point for your budget process. Thank you. But I think that has to address all new revenue sources. Absolutely. So if an athletic fee is created and that's a new revenue source or parking fees, that has to be part of the revenue as well. I mean, the whole, the whole issue is, is that it, no everything's put on the table, right. which means that it could have a dramatic effect. And so I'm happy to entertain that discussion at a later date. Yeah. And I'm happy to go through it, but everything's put on the table, and I'm not too sure that it's going to be as beneficial. And that's that's fine, but um, I'm just saying that now. But I, I may be wrong. Well, I think what we have to remember is that we're all one town. It's not a we and a they type scenario, and there's only one bucket of money. If you're going to take it from one and put it to the other, then you're just going to hurt one of the other sides. You know, if you want to all of a sudden tell the school that their budget is $250,000 less because they have to pay for cutting the grass, then do it. But you got to lay off, you know, your school product is going to go down the tubes. You can buy a new mower, but you just lost five teachers. You know, we're, we can't do things to create this we, they situation. It's got to be one unison town that moves forward. If you want to change the formula, change the formula. If you change the money spread, if you give the school $200,000 more money, then you're going to have to lay off three firefighters. You know, there's no secret way to do it. You can set the formula up any way you want, but this year, the town's percentage went up more than the schools. So, you know, the, the thought process has got to be whatever revenue source you want to do, that they both go up equally, or, you know, one or the other is going to pay the price. I think what you have to ask yourself is what makes more sense? Doing what you just said, or does it make more sense to take that revenue on beach stickers to maintain the parking lots, the beaches, and the, the staff at the beach? So if we do what you said, please. And fire, and that, that's where the other 50,000 has got to come from. Right. Please, so where's fire, gonna get, that's what I'm going to ask you, Tony. These set to other issues. Right. And, and, and I agree with what everyone's saying. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, folks, I agree with John's what everyone's side. saying. It's like, yeah. you know, which way do you want to zero look sum? No, no, but the integrity of the formula is what is driving it, not where we decide to randomly allocate money. Mr. Johnson, you get the last word because then I want a motion on this. That's all I'm saying. Like, 
I'm just trying to balance. I'm saying my revenue is going, school money is going down by uh, $75,000. Didn't have the money last year. I had it. Even much. You make the uh, formula's changing. The money's going back. Town side's growing by 1.2 percent. I'm only growing by 0.4. I know you don't think it's a lot, but you know we just presented you a budget that we're laying off 19.8 people and I don't know 15 teachers. So you want to make the decision that go back, we'll come back, we'll add another teacher when we lay off 1.8 people. That's what we'll do. I mean, but the, let's not pretend that the money was on the town side last year. It wasn't, it was in the school, that was the split. We came this year, now that's why if you look at the town budget, it's growing by 1.2, school's growing by 0.4. We're moving the money back. Okay. Is think, there a motion that we need to yeah. draw this conclusion? We Can still have a number of items. Um, I mean, is this, no, no, is this something you need to decide tonight? Well, I think it's How do you feel about Joe not sitting there? Not having his say in it? Well, the After problem is th you need a budget number okay. to move forward for the next couple of weeks. You know, and this is this doesn't <laughs> this doesn't just come up last night. We've been we've been talking about this for 11 months. So, um, you know, this isn't new. So if you, I think it has to be done. Otherwise, no one's going to know what the number is. Can we suggest that? we cut the other 57000 for your balanced budget? I don't know. But we can suggest we cut the other 57000 for our budget. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Johnson, okay. So I make a motion that we uh, adjust the split to 66.812 for the school and 33.19 for the town. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Mr. Motion. Uh, Mr. Murray. Mr. Motion. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's, it's unfortunate if maybe the school committee could at least tell Mr. Johnson not to slam the door when he leaves the hearing room it would be greatly appreciated next time he's here discussion seeing none all in favor say aye aye, aye. all against say nay nay it's a two to two split the motion does not carry moving on to agenda item number 10 it is a discussion vote of street acceptance and it's a layout Mr. Banger yes thank you I this thank is you for sort your of a long evening I'll try not to be too chatty tonight we have four streets that are looking to come to town meeting to be accepted um, actually there will be three the um, Three, or I thought yes. it was Pine View Circle and Pine View yeah, Lane. Yeah, I'm sorry, there will be Blossom four. and Cornerstone. Correct. Okay. Correct, yeah. It's four. I apologize. Um, the, the committee is made up of a member of the planning board, the advisory committee, the town engineer, and the chairman of the board of selectmen. Uh, property owners petition the board of selectmen uh, for street acceptance, and then there, it's referred to the street acceptance committee, for whom I am the um, mouthpiece today. Uh, it comes to the Street Acceptance Committee for study and recommendation. Uh, since last January, we, the, the town has received nine petitions um, for street acceptance. Two of those were withdrawn by the applicants. Four more were sent off to, an, to our engineering firm to analyze for conformance with the uh, town street standards. Um, and three more have been received that haven't been analyzed yet and will be, be bringing forward to you uh, for the fall special town meeting because they're not will not be able to be ready for the annual town meeting what the street acceptance committee recommends at this point voted uh, unanimously that uh, they would bring to you the recommendation that you carry on to town meeting uh, the cornerstone lane blossom street pine view circle and pine view lane for consideration by time meet town meeting the reason that these four streets are being recommended is that 75% of the property owners on those private ways requested consideration as a private as as a public way. Uh, the second reason is that the DPW has determined that it's feasible for the street to meet an acceptable standard for a small residential way with some investment, and 75% of the residents on those streets have agreed to pay by betterment. Uh, and not to exceed engineering cost estimate to bring the street up to a like new level of repair. So in other words, 75% of the residents at a minimum on those streets have agreed that they would bring their street up 
to a level of standard that's acceptable to the town for acceptance in terms of degree of maintenance, degree of, uh, of uh, the, uh, new paving, and the range and estimates um, for improvements in those streets ranges from uh, three or $4,000 to an almost new subdivision to uh, nearly $160,000 for much older streets that, that are uh, in need of great amount of repair. Nonetheless, residents request that their streets be forwarded to town meeting and the way we, that happens is that you uh, vote to have those streets laid out and a public hearing be take place within the next couple of weeks in which the applicants are all invited in, you have a public meeting, and uh, then next steps follow from there. So, so we're on the hook to bring these up to public yes. standards? Yes. What, in no, the range no. From uh, the, it would be by betterment. Okay. All right. Okay. The residents have agreed to a betterment, which you would initiate. Uh, that's within your uh, jurisdictional powers to do. Um, and that uh, the idea is that a town meeting, the article before town meeting would be that such and such a street be accepted as a public way as laid out by the Board of Selectmen um, and uh, to be funded by a betterment. But then from there out, we're on the hook for the cost because it's a public way. Correct. So, but to bring it up to standard yes. it's on is them. on them. Right. But and then, then it after goes that, on the Chapter 90 inventory too. Right. Pardon me. It goes on the Chapter 90 inventory for the number of public. That's why we started down yep. this path. Yep. Yep. So eventually we'll get money more back. Money. Yeah. Understood. Can I just make a comment? Some of these newer developments, I sh certainly would hope there'd be a lot less. Yes. To yeah, bring up to the, standards. Uh, the newest one on cost. here is Cornerstone Lane. Uh, requires very minimal. Uh, three or four thousand dollars worth of additional work. Actually, the developer and the residents have taken care of many of the items that were on the list right. already. Uh, but there are some legal costs of transferring it uh, from private to public, and that's essentially what remains. Um, a much older street will require complete uh, full depth renovation and restoration and paving with some drainage work. Wow. Like nine. And then those residents will live on a fine, a, one of the best streets in town, and that's uh, like a new subdivision street. Right. And it will be plowed. Right. Yep. So the cost to the town after accepting it will be uh, minimal other than uh, maintaining a well built street. A motion? Any other questions? Audience? No? Yes. Move the board select and vote to lay out the following ways to notify the abutting property owners by letter and publish notice that it is the board's intention to further consider the adoption of the layout of Pineview Drive, Pineview Circle, Cornerstone Lane, and Blossom Street at a public meeting to be held on March 1st, 2011. Second by Mr. Harris. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Mark, thank, thank you. you. Mark's on the committee also. So thank you for staying, Mark. All right, moving on to adjust agenda item number 11, a vote, snow and ice deficit spending. Trisha, are you handling that or is Al handling it? <coughs> yeah, I think the information Kim included in the packet is fairly straightforward. We have a snow and ice budget of roughly, um, are you going to give me an updated one? Yeah, this is all the... Right original yeah. budget and this is the degree of okay. deficit at this moment all right so um, the FY 11 appropriated budget for snow and ice is four hundred eighty eight thousand four hundred seventy six dollars that was exhausted um, by the storm last week right now um, we have receivables of about forty seven thousand six thirty in excess of that all the board simply has to do is vote to allow to deficit spend on that account the number is um, not needed to be included in part of your motion, but as the weather gets better and this number climbs, we need to address it at the special town meeting to decide where the funds, when we talk about balance, bal you know, budget challenges, it's 47,006 plus and growing right now that um, needs to have a funding source for the town meeting. Would you like a motion? Please. Will the board of and vote to deficit spend beyond the appropriation for snow and ice budget for fiscal year 2011? Second. Second by Mr. Murray. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Agenda item number 12, award cellular telephone tower bid. This is a, a motion for the board to award, uh, according to the motion that Kim has drafted, uh, the bid to AT&T for the construction of our wireless facility uh, at Wampatuck School contingent on successful negotiations. What is included here is the minimum bid price set in the bid package 
was 24,000 and then as you see escalates to a high of 42,000 at the end of the term in 20 years. Um, what will happen is the board has to sign a release if you vote this way tonight the chair has to sign for them to be able to enter the property and do their due diligence in terms of what they need for site development. Um, we've informed them that they have to be in contact with the superintendent and the school each time or whatever their intended schedule is. Um, and then they will make application to the ZBA. This will go through the formal review process similar to the one in Tilden and also they will uh, work with the ZBA on having an informational session about the health effects potential alleged or otherwise um, for cell towers um, which is one of the requests that the school committee had when we first approached them about this. Question. The, um, the assessor's map that was included in our packet seemed to have a locus. Is that that square with the cross? Yes. Uh, so it's basically located, located, I'm not sure if it's in the trees or the brush, but that's the location of it. It's really almost kissing the Goulston property that's, end okay. back there. We tried to, Al actually can speak oh, to it. We Goulston tried to get it back there as All much right. as possible. Street. Away from the physical structure of the school. The other thing I at least asked the board to consider, and I'm not sure whether, and if it's inappropriate, then I'm, I'm happy to say not to, but when it goes to zoning, I, I'd love to see if there's any way that we could suggest that if they're going to be doing any work in this area of building a tower, if there's anything with with some sort of like, um, I say mitigation or something, because the ball field is so poor at Hadley's or any way that they, since they're going to be having trucks over there, anything they can do to improve the ball field. Well, that you know. could, I assume, be entertained as part of the discussion when they go to the ZBA. That's what I was wondering if we'd send something, at least to, if they could at least ask or inquire in that area, because the ball field there, the, what, it's not even a ball field, it has rocks, boulders in the middle of it. And I'm like, be nice to have. Even for Little League. Even for, for the kids there in Little League, but, or T-ball, because that's where Right, and I think going idea. forward, one of the things I want to explore with the board is sort of this revenue source, since it's directly on school property, as a mitigation. Um, Might be a good time to talk about that another day. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, there's different sources of revenue coming in, so. Um. Would have been nice if you mentioned that earlier. <laughs> All right, so do you need a vote from us? Yes, I can right. have the motion there. Move the board of selection vote to award the bid for a proposed cell tower at the Wapatuck School to AT&T contingent upon successful negotiation of contract terms and execution of lease agreement exclusively subject to town meeting approval. Yeah, that's the other piece. There needs to be a warrant article to approve the lease at town meeting. Thank so you. it's on the warrant. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. Just aye. sir, two votes? Oh, aye. Sorry. Three votes, Sean? I said aye. All right, that's four. Unanimous. Thank you, Tim. Agenda item number uh, 13, which is a discussion vote, the Hummer Rock Beach Sticker Fee. Um, I won't read this verbatim, but um, I think the board charged the committee to make a recommendation last year dealing with the situation about the um, Marshfield residents having to pay the same non-resident fee for non-Marshfield residents but not situate residents. The Beach Sticker Committee recommended at that time that they didn't want to change anything midstream but to revisit the issue again. So they met on January 28th and you have their recommendations um, subject to your the board's vote and approval. And basically, they're, they're suggesting that for Marshfield residents that there would be a fee of $100, not a $200 fee as it was last year. It would be capped at 200 stickers for Marshfield residents. Um, a $200 fee, which is what we had last year for 300 out-of-town residents. And what's the fee? Is it 35 or $40? 35 $35 for town residents. And that you're also looking to shift um, the purchase dates, instead of going from July 1st to June 30th, idea. you're looking to try to do it from April 1st to March 31st. Yeah, one of the things we do is we try to be in regular contact with other beach communities, and Duxbury in particular does it this way. I don't think we'll ever avoid the flush of people that come in right before um, the 4th of July, but ideally we want people to buy them online, um, and they're at recreation registration programs, and that so by moving it out earlier, people can start getting them right away. Three questions that I had when I looked at this. Number one, uh, is there an ability for town employees to get the town rate in the event that they don't live in situate? That was my first question. Was Town it, employees? Yeah. No. Okay. Is that a consideration that maybe they think about? If you're a town employee and you don't live in situate, do you want to go to a situate beach? 
but then it, the fact that you're helping the town, you know, is it's that a consideration? It's asked frequently, but um, we have not. I don't know about the board. I was thinking that would be nice. The second was Lighthouse Park. I noticed last year a lot of people who didn't have who didn't have stickers would go to Lighthouse, the ho Lighthouse, because there's a beach there. And so whether or not the beach committee would think about posting it for signs for beach stickers on one side and maybe putting temporary parking for 30-minute parking on the on the ocean side, the harbor side, so that people could go there, you know, at least to yeah, consider it. Yeah, I mean, I, this, 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 the charge of this committee wasn't to be ever per in perpetuity. I mean, the specific charge was to try was to address the, the cut in the budget and the deficit. So, you know, we might need to look at a new charge or whatever, but we, we haven't contemplated anything beyond what was in the original scope. It goes to my next one, which was credit cards and doing online or discounts. But I mean, I think that might be something to think about doing. We do all that. One thing we did talk about, but um, is do maybe doing a two-year sticker. So for sixty bucks, you could get a two-year sticker instead of seventy, and that cuts down on the volume here. Questions, Mr. Murray? Just a quick one about the is the idea behind capping them at three hundred and two hundred, just so they don't crowd out our own residents? Yeah because we couldn't gauge how many people would actually come because we never opened it up to non-resident before okay. and we didn't sell uh, we sold actually I have that somewhere 154 non-resident last year. Okay. and is there a uh, second sticker option uh, families can buy a second sticker it's the same price as the first sticker $35 All right. thank you mr. chair mr. Vignani so we sold 154 non-resident stickers last year at $300. 200. At 200. Yes. And And I think How many 16 of them were March Fourth. Yes, it did have an impact. Um what um how many resident stickers did we sell? Um 6,000. 6,000. Wow. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is you've got expenses here of 192000 um, So w how is the revenue? Do we expect to sell another 6000 at 35? Um, I think I gave you, was there a revenue projection in there that Mary's not here? I had one. That equals 210 so that covers it. Yeah, the budget, I think, roughly 215. So I guess, just so I can understand this, bef before, and we went over this, the money, the expenses that we have taken out of the town budget and put into this enterprise fund is $130,000 for lifeguards, $8,000 from rec for uniforms, seventy. Yeah. I'm just going Are you down doing your list. the FY10 budget? Well, this is what we did way back when when we changed, when we took, when we created a revolving fund that had 100 and, what was the number they gave you, Sean? 102? 112. 8,000, 100 and something? 112. 116, 112. Right. 112, 116,000 dollars. 116 times .333 equals $55,000 that was the towns and 70, what they say, 77 was the schools? Whatever. Right, so that revenue went away and the town took 130, eight, seven, three. This seaweed removal is new, so that, that wasn't an expenditure before. 1,800 from DPW, another 1,800 from printing, and the capital is new. So about $162,000 worth of expenses out of the town budget and threw it into this revolving fund. No, that's not accurate, and I need to find the budget. Um, because the beach sticker revenue was $116,000 before the revolving <coughs> fund was created. Right. And the subsidy for lifeguards alone was another 68000 so the whole budget was like 192,000. We were, the general fund was subsidizing the shortfall from the stickers. It covered uniforms. Um, it did not cover trash removals. That was eaten by the enterprise funds, not the general fund. It did not cover seaweed removal. No, no, there's no eaten by, it, it was part of the town. The town got a number 
and it was 13 million something. And all of these expenses were in that number, whether it was in DPW, rec, health, or police. All of these numbers were in that number forever. So we had to expend $160,000 of the budget was in one of these departments. So we created a revolving fund and $160,000 of all those departments went to this revolving fund. We make allocations for all of these for, for police, I guess it's 7,500, and then the, the lifeguards and all that stuff went over there. I'm confused when you say that money went. Those budgets were reduced because they were gonna, the revenue from the fees were gonna come. Those budgets were reduced. Right, that exactly. The town. So, the, so town, the police department budget was reduced. Exactly my point. Okay. The town budget was reduced by $162,000, and it went to a revolving fund. So now the town still got their number minus 55 because they lost $55,000 in revenue. And we took $162,000 worth of expenses and put it in this revolving fund. And hmm. those expenses are now spent on what, IT department or whatever, whatever else we decided to, to spend it on because those expenses were taken out of the town budget and thrown into the revolving fund. So the town lost $162,000 worth of expenses and $55,000 worth of revenue. The school lost $77,000 worth of revenue. The school lost nothing. They were held harmless and it was $72,000 worth of revenue. Last year, this last year. Last year, that's what you're talking about last year. Well, we can roll it forward to this year. Just so we're all aware of what, what happened. I thought that was agenda item number nine, and we're on. Well, Thursday. it's the same topic. Okay, so other questions? Need a motion? Did yes, the, we do. Oh, Unless, sorry. Mr. Vignani. Just did we, did the committee consider reducing that Hummer Rock only below 100? Yes. And what was the thoughts? That it needed to be. Uh, more than what residents in town were actually paying for the sticker. And the since most, a lot of people get two stickers, the gap between 70 and 100 was seen to be, you know, there should be a premium on it. Because they get two stickers? If a lot of folks in town get two stickers, and the, so two stickers is $70,000, $70. Well, we didn't discount that second sticker for the not, second car and family? Anymore. Okay. Right. Can the out-of-towners buy two? Uh, that hasn't happened, but prob probably not. I mean, I don't think we track it because we only spend. Most of the folks who bought non-resident last year were from Norwell, Pembroke, and Hanover, with yeah. a couple of aberrant ones, some from Burlington, yeah. some from New Hampshire. So would you guys like to consider reducing the Hummer Rock only beach sticker? I mean, you can only go to one of our s five or six beaches. <coughs> The residents pay 35. This will probably be mostly Marshfield people, right? I'm, I'm gonna imagine of the 154 people, the 16 that bought, 16 Marshfield people, you know, we had, how many did we have before, Kim? Probably 300. How many Marshfield people bought it before we changed the rates? 354. 354. I'm sorry, th Tony, 319. 300, wow. So we went from 319 to 16? I personally was hoping it was going to be 75, but I don't know if everyone has a, a big uh, what's in that race. I I have never heard from some well not that many, but they were quite vocal people that grew up in this town that raising their family in Marshfield that just went to Humrock. I have no problem if rescinding the motion if it's been made or going to $75. I, just the way I feel. For those people that grew up, and I can name names. 16 times grew up 25. In Marshall, grew up in Sedgwick, now live in Marshall, just want to use Humrock. You sell f five more tickets. <laughs> Divided by. Well, all right, so um, what would be the number you want to look at, $75? I wouldn't say any less than that. Not less than 75. No. I'll, I don't have strong feelings either way, so. I think it's great that there's a lower for the Hummer Rock, for the Marshfield 
Humrock only for Marsh. Humrock only out of towners. I don't have strong feelings at 100 or 75. I'll go with either one. But someone make a motion. I'll make a motion. Move the board.